again and sort of show you just how easy it was to use so that you could take us up on our offer because there's still a lot of them that we haven't we I think we have right now seven seven of our libraries have um, are using the pro edition which is wonderful um, but we would be thrilled to have all of you using it so we're going to kind of start right at the beginning so yeah I think it's dancing there we go is that going to work Oh, yeah, right. Do we have our little thing? Yes, <laughs> with like the clicker, it's not working. <laughs> I'm not sure where to point. Okay, take it away. <laughs> um, the... Yeah. Are we loud enough? Can everyone hear us okay? We only have one microphone, so instead of passing it back and forth, we'll just try to use teacher voices. So we'll try to be loud enough, so. Yes. These are some of the Canva reviews that we found and we thought they were very relevant to what we're wanting and shooting to show everybody. Um, one says, you know, Canva is used across the board for everything and that's the beauty of it. It can be used for email marketing, creating posters, creating social media posts, literally anything that needs a graphic or images. And I think this is one of the things that I heard most whenever we are doing our summer library programming is that how am I supposed to get the information out to the schools, how am I supposed to get all of this information, you know, to everyone so that they do know about our programming. Well, Canva has made it very, very easy for you because you're literally just borrowing their templates, changing the information and there are you know, 70 a lot. Like, like a <laughs> it's in there. Yeah, it, yeah, we've got it coming up. So yes. it's not one of the slides. But bunch. there are so many, and you you're really just taking it. It's already got its color formation behind it. So you just find one that's wild and looks like what you're doing. Because we found all kinds. I mean, oh, for yeah. uh, I mean giraffes and yeah. animal um, ones for kids, mm -hmm. and there's ones that are like a little more sophisticated if it's for your adult group or adult programming. So there are just so so many of them out there. So. I kind of, want, I'm going to take away that excuse. Some people are like, you know, we don't know how we're going to make all that, the posters and all that. I'm like, uh, nope, I'm not going to hear that anymore. So yeah. And then the next one was Canva had been a huge help among my business by helping us create the perfect images for Facebook ads and organic social media posts. And we have tried really hard to kind of um, promote your Facebook pages because I understand that there's, you know, there's a lot of different platforms now and that younger users are, you know, Snapchatting and Instagram or whatever they're using. But the beauty of Canva is that you can do it to all of them. So there's a multi, you know, you can do it up to all of them. So it'll go to each one of them. So you create it just once and then you just shoot it out there to all of them. So that's the beauty of it as well. Um, the possibilities with Canva are incredible and endless. They provide numerous ways to create content while keeping your branding consistent. So once you've created a template, it, no, it doesn't go anywhere. So it is saved. All of the things that we've created so far in Northwest, any of us, if we get onto our account, can see every single thing that we've made. So I know that that to me is a big thing. Because sometimes it's like, what folder did I put that in? And where is that one? And I know we made that four years ago. I know it's here somewhere. <laughs> Who put it where? And so that, again, is the beauty of the platform because it's right there. So and like for us, each account that we've created, we can put five under it. So we've kind of figured that out. Dave and Val figured out how to do that. That, that took a little doing because everything is online with Canva. There is no like, uh, let's call them up and see. <laughs> so at first I was like, oh no, I mean, what do we do that we can't talk to these people, but everything is there for you. They do make it pretty user-friendly. So that's another benefit. Um, Canva has helped create inexpensive graphic art. I can't even see that. Royalty okay. free. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> royalty free images and low cost graphic design tools so that's a good thing is you don't have to go to google and find things that don't have watermarks because right. nobody likes those <laughs> <laughs> and it helps us avoid paying large licensing fees for graphic design software which again it's great <laughs> um, and it, the royalty free marketing images right. no watermarks right. yay <laughs> well and for the library world we also know that we don't want to infringe you know that's always yes. our biggest thing is that we do not want to be sued <laughs> by anyone that you used our picture on your you know facebook post it's like uh, no i actually have permission to do it because it always any of how many of you are using it currently can i kind of ask great 
Um, I love it because right away, when you post something, it says right under canva.com. You know what I mean? So it's not like this was posted by Desiree. This was posted by Mary. It's like right underneath there is that they know, you know, someone who's looking at it, that it was, you know, you used it through Canva. So it really would never come back on you, which is another good thing. <laughs> so it's like, yes, I used this template. I have permission. So we're big on permissions. That's something that, you know, we kind of want to keep making sure we're always on top of. Yeah, this is not working. <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Stop us at any time. So it'll be posted by canva.com. What if it's your property from the library and it's your picture? You can use it. Do you they, yeah, they, oh, they, you upload they, it. That's the do they then take um, control of that picture nope. and say that anybody nope. can use it? You upload it and you can delete it. You can do whatever you want it because it's your right. It stays library. in your, like each um, user has their own account. So if you set up for um, your library, you have your own account. And all of your graphics that you upload to it, every photo that you upload, you can't upload in just the free version. So a lot of people are like, well, I can just use the free version. You can. I mean, it's out there. That's really easy for things like we're going to be having a, a book sale. We're going to be having this. Mm -hmm. But the Pro Edition lets you upload your, like, you know, for us, you guys know that this was our new logo. And we have had a hard time making sure that people are like, that's their logo, you know, so that's a biggie to us. And so we wanted that to get out there. So we upload that and put it on a lot of our things now so it can be seen. So that and is it's one. it's not seen by other users. Nope. It's mm -hmm. just you. So I think yep. that's what she was getting at. Yeah. Well, I just didn't want somebody to yeah. take nope. a proprietary picture nope. that we took yes. that somebody else didn't want nope, out they there. Cannot, they have no access. Care. Nope. Okay. Yep. Only right. uploads to yours. It's pretty much like you had your own file. So, Great. I mean, it's just like, you know, on your hard drive, you know, yeah. basically, because okay. no one can get into your account. So, yep, absolutely. Let's let you click. I can put this down. This is not working. <laughs> oh, thank so much for the clicker. Well, we're going to start right from the beginning. And who better to tell you how to do it than Canva? So they've kind of included all of these how-to videos themselves, which is why we're sharing them. Because again, I always have someone say, well, after you did your presentation, I didn't know what to do. So I'll be like, um, yep, <laughs> here's the link. So, and that's the beauty, but we'll send this out to all of you and you'll be able to click right on it as we're like, just like a, a PowerPoint presentation. And to me, this is very similar to PowerPoint. But because of all the, the templates, I don't know how many of you have had to create all of your things on PowerPoint over the years. I've probably done about a thousand PowerPoints and mm -hmm. it can take a long time. We did this in just a few days. I mean, mm -hmm. we knew what we wanted to do, so that makes it easy, but it's so nice. I, I call it borrowing. Borrowing templates is so much nicer than like, well, how do I want to make that one? What am I going to do? You know, what's going to be my theme? They have the themes and you just say add a new page and it has the same theme or you pick a different one to put in. But yep, here we go. And then just down here. Let's take a look at the homepage. Oh, where's our sound? Do we not have our sound Ooh. Yeah, we're. Like done that. We have great big sound. Why was the sound? <laughs> There's probably some plugs that didn't get plugged in. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Give us just a sec. Yeah, I don't know more. <coughs> Make sure that it's all set up. Well, I can hear it on the digital projector. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we can only hear it here. Yeah, I hear it, on the it was on the projector yeah. is where it was going to because right. it's on the so HDMI. Yeah. Where was it loaded? Yeah, there is no, there isn't another cable to plug into the speaker. Well, uh, there is because we found it before. Thank you, Alice. Can you grab someone for us? Sorry, guys. Started again, which one is? Sure. Yeah, we are. Welcome to Canva. Let's take a look around yeah, the page and learn how to find what page to start designing. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> it's only coming out of here. Yeah, that's not enough. We have to have our yeah. We'll see what it is. We'll be ready for the next presentation. Heck yeah. <laughs> we'll be the guinea pigs here. He's going through the projector. Just the projector right instead of all of our. Did you change your settings on your computer to send it out? 
it's going through the projector through the HDMI cable instead of the sound system. Where's the? That's the that's the speaker. Oh, well, um, on your display, did you change it to send it out? This way. It's it's going through here and it's just coming out. That's the speaker on the projector. That's where it's coming from. So what's everybody reading? I know. <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I got a room of librarians. So you know, you know, you know, you right? Come on. House of Leaves. House of Leaves. Yeah. Never heard of it. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. How come you don't have an audio? <laughs> Specific in mind, 
you can enter the custom dimensions here. In the top menu, you can discover templates by theme, explore photo and icon libraries, printed products, apps, and more, or access Design School, where you can learn to use Canva and supercharge your design skills. The sidebar helps you organize your designs. You'll find all the designs you've created in this tab and designs shared with you by your team in this one. Creating a team is easy. Just add the people you want to design with, assign their role, and invite them. You can also create folders for designs, photos, content, and ideas to keep your projects organized. Canvas homepage makes it easy for you to design anything. Now we can hear it. Yeah. <laughs> like, thank goodness. Um, yeah, that's that's exactly. Thank you, Frank. That's exactly our point. He just said it makes everything look so professional. <laughs> that's exactly. Thank you. <laughs> With simple sharing, it allows you to schedule your designs to go onto your social media. It can be your Instagram, Facebook any kinds of social media you have <laughs> and the magic resize feature is what we mentioned earlier that you make one design and you can directly be like hey i want this to be an instagram post and let's say a facebook <laughs> cover it'll make both of those sizes and adjust it so that fits the best for that social media it's very nice. <laughs> it is. And they kind of thought of everything. I mean, yeah. you know, it, I don't know where it's been our whole lives, but it's here now. So we're pretty excited yes. to have it. So, yeah, right. absolutely. And um, deciding what you want to create, like, that's the very first thing that I do is that I go to the home page that is our page, right in the um, search. I just say, I'm going to make something that is, you know, if I want to do a Fourth of July, I need to put something on there saying, you know, happy Fourth of July from NWKLS to all of our, you know, all of our member libraries or whatever I'm trying to create. I usually just put in like Fourth of July. I will put in um, when I did our summer library program, I put in there um, like rainforest because I had in my head that I wanted something, you know, with a tail. So I was thinking of the chameleon, you know, that we had in the um, part of it. So then this beautiful background that was green with the tropical, but that's it. You know what I mean? It was, and it looks like I spent hours on it when I actually spent minutes. So I'm sorry, George, I spent hours on it. Yeah, I, I spent hours on it. But, <laughs> you know, that that's the beauty of it is because, you know, once I started doing it, I'm like, where has this been? You cannot do that with PowerPoint. And the first thing that we noticed when we started doing it, Val and I, because I, I remember going running to her and I was like, I can take that and put it on like all of the folders for the summer library mm -hmm. program because I just, you know, took it and put it into, you know, Avery.com and then use that image there. Because once you save the image as a JPEG, it's yours to use in whatever format yeah. you want. I could have put it on the, you know, name tags. I could put it on the folders. I could put it, I mean, I could have made t-shirts with it. I created it. So it is mine. And, it, you know, under their license, it is my creation you know, our NWKLS's creation. So that's the beauty of that too. And just like Val said, then posting it to your Instagram, posting it to Facebook, posting it, you know, you can snap it to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> you can do whatever you want to do you with it. You can do TikTok with it. Yeah. So if you really want to get it, wow. <laughs> you want to reach that younger group of oh, yeah. like, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes. you got to go with whatever is the, you know, what, what's the, where everybody's at. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, does it really do JPEG? No, no it does format. not. No, it's, it's like if you're doing PNG, something or JPEG, yep, uh, it has print prints, you can choose and, and yeah, yep. and yep. it is high, yeah, like the high resolution. Yeah, that's and it's video, all. And you can yep. do everything. Yep, every single one of them. And it, as soon as you put it on, like, you know, over the years, obviously that was the only way we could do some things that we wanted to do our, ourselves was, you know, I'm not gonna go to a graphic artist for everything that we needed, you know, done. So you'd create it, but then when you put it on Facebook, it's kind of like a little bit blurry, you know, it's not quite that sharp. So the first time we put this, I was like, oh, you know what I mean? Like, this is a winner. We've got this now, finally, you know what I mean? Because it was just gorgeous and it was gorgeous on the computer. It was, you know, perfect on, you know, the um, our iPhones and whatever device, you know, 
whatever one you, you know, platform you use, but yeah, it, it really is. And following the easy path, you know, at first you're like, oh gosh, this is going to be one of those ones I have to go up here and I have to go. Mm -hmm. No, it's all along the left side. There is not anything that you can't find. And then the only other place are like three buttons up at the top that say, you know, do you want to download this, share it, or post it to your, it's like, um, I don't think I could get any easier. Mm -hmm. So that's the other beauty of it. And choosing a template, the greatest part of this program is that you can recreate and add your own graphics and photos. And like I said, the free version, you cannot upload your photos. But they have thousands, I mean, probably like 50,000, 100,000, I don't know, they have a lot, so you can just scroll through all of them. I don't know if we have that, like we, we have some, you know, stats for you, I'm not sure if we did the one that how many photos they have, but they have a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you want to brand it and do it yourself, so you want your, you know, your kids, you know, faces mm -hmm. in the summer library program that you're you know, trying to get them to come to the final night or whatever. So you want to put kids that have been in the program and put that on there. So, but yes, so the pro, the pro version is available to all of our member libraries. So please remember that. So we will, we will get that to you. So you just have to hand in your certificate that I gave everyone. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's your <laughs> yeah, if you're yeah, if you're forget it, that's true. When you want to print bit different things, but yeah. it's worth it. So yeah. here's here are some of our design tips because we know we're not all graphic. Let's artists. discover Canvas editor, learn how to create a design and customize a template. Great. From the home page, select a template and start with a new blank design. Welcome to the editor. This is the side panel where you'll find all the things you can click or drag and drop to add to your page. In the templates tab, there are thousands of professional designs to get you started. Upload your own photos or videos in the upload tab, just like this. Browse millions of premium stock photos from our photo libraries. Search, type in the email you know, right. you're looking for. To narrow it down more, add a plus symbol and then another keyword. Or use these handy filters. In the elements tab, you'll find illustrations, shapes, animated stickers, charts, graphics, and much more. Search in exactly the same way. There's so much to explore. Discover our high quality video library with millions of videos at your fingertips. Perfect to get your designs moving. To create your first design, start from scratch or use a template. Everything is customizable. Select the object you want to change and a toolbar will appear above. It's never been easier to express your creativity. And it really is just that easy. I mean, at first you're like, oh yeah, that's just in the video, but it is just that easy, so. Okay. These are some of the creations that Mary and I have done. And I bet you probably didn't think, hey, they did that in Canva at <laughs> first, because it's like, wow. <laughs> so, that was for the library yeah program. this is actually asked if george had um, sent it to me and they the um they wanted the stats for the state so they were like george was like mary could you do that i'm like uh, sure i can figure that out and i was just like that was already an existing template i was like it couldn't be more perfect <laughs> i mean sunflower so then all of our stats you know all of the information that you guys um send me for the summer library program stats that's all of it in there it's a little hard to read but it's like about the adult programming and how many thousands you know participated in 20 um 2020 so see now this year now i want to make a new one all i have to do is use the exact same template and just change the numbers yep. so it's just that easy yeah, and awesome. you can make a large poster with it like i could do it like val shared earlier I can turn that into a large poster. I can turn that into bookmarks. I can turn it into whatever I want to make it into because it's that versatile to change those things up. So, and then the middle one I used on one of our Verso pages, one of our member libraries, and it was 
just something that they wanted on their page. And so I just put that information on there, added the background that went with everything and bam, export it as like a PNG and <laughs> ta-da, you can yeah. upload it right on there. And it's just great. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you've been to our web page lately, but Val has worked very hard to get all of that. And when you look at all of the upcoming workshops and things, it just scrolls through yeah. and all of it has been created. Every one of the little posters, like for our um, upcoming one, the, um, uh, the STEAM on a budget, any budget, I guess, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. So I should remember the exact title, <laughs> but I'm not right this second. But um, yeah, so that she has that, she did a um, one for that. Then I could take that same one that she created, put it on our Facebook page. So <coughs> it's made it very easy. And when they said earlier about your team shares it, so at your library, if you're, you know, your children's librarian or you've got, you know, an assistant librarian or you've got another staff member that you can say to them, hey, I, I'm i not there today, but go to our go to our account, bring up that one and just change in there and say that we're, we're closed today and then upload that to our Facebook page. So, I mean, it's something that is so much easier because you've got one account, same, you know, the same login. We could all log in at exactly the same time under it because I know sometimes, you know what I mean? That's a biggie too is that, oh, well, where's that, like, Melanie said, where's it all stored? It's all stored to share with each other only. You know what I mean? There's nobody else that can get into it. So yeah, it is really just that easy. And then the last one is we are all makers, which again is like, you know, for those of us that work in the children's, you know, doing all of that, right there is a beautiful poster that I can put in my children's library section. And you can say to me, Mary, can we borrow it? And I'll be like, you are our members. You can have it. <laughs> you know I mean? yeah. so, there it is, ready to go. And I think it was something else. I don't remember what it was, but they had the letters down the yeah. side. And I was like, oh, I can just do yeah. that and put in each of the things. I was like, how much easier does it get? So and We have a question from the Zoom folks. Oh, perfect. Uh, Pat says, um, if you change the original and save it, does it change the original or create a new one? If you just it, yeah, in, it does change it, but you have access to every single change that you have made. Such a good question, Pat, because I was almost about to die one day because well, I had switched something. I had made, which I thought was a really good poster, and I was like, oh no, I've lost it because I changed one thing, and it, then it just saves it. But it is much like the Google Forms or, or anything in the Google, you know, that you're doing under that. It saves every single um, previous, yeah. like in your history. It was saved on this date, saved on that date. So I can go back to every one of them and retrieve it. So yes, tell her that I can show her how to do that because I did it by making a mistake and then had to find it. <laughs> it's the best way, make mistakes and then you have to solve it and you know, drive yourself yeah. crazy. You so, and then you figure it out. <laughs> You're like, I can do this. You're like, oh, gosh. Gosh. Yeah. So if say it like that, three step sign up for Hoopla does need help and there's a phone number. Now, if I wanted to steal that yep. or borrow it. Borrow, we don't steal anything. <laughs> borrow, <laughs> then would I ask you, would I go to the library that you created can, it? Would well, they, it would be yeah, ours yeah. right now because we made this one. Right. If you see one from, let's say, Joaquini, they make one that you really like and you're like, oh my yeah. gosh, I want that. Yep. There's a share <laughs> then you just go ask them and okay. right. they can send you the Yep, they'll link share it right to you. You can send it right, they'll send it just by email to you. Then you'll upload it on yours and you can make any changes you want to it. So yep. yeah, that's the beauty of it too. You can share from account to account, not just within your own. So you can do it within your own. Like, <laughs> like I said earlier, we can put five under an account that we create and pay for. So we kind of had to figure that out. That took us a little bit because we're like, can we not just have everybody under us? Oh no, that was not oh, like, no. that was not like so, so good. But yeah, <laughs> we figured that out. So now we've got it. Yep. Yep. Cool. Ooh, and another video. Yeah, this guy is fantastic. <laughs> In this video, I'm going to share with you 20 Canva tips, tricks and hacks that you can apply today to become a better designer using Canva and make your workflow like a whole lot smoother. Yeah. Hey, my name's Aurelius, and on this channel, I'll share my yeah. tips, tool reviews, and training to help you build and scale your digital business. So if that interests you, be sure to hit that subscribe button below. Turn on notifications too, so that you'll be the first to know any new videos I post up here on this channel. With that said, I want to share with you 20 tips, tricks, and hacks that I wish I knew when I started using Canva. Now, tip number one I want to share with you is when you're working with multiple layers, Sometimes you will come across layers that are quite close together. I want to select the middle layer, but sometimes that can be challenging. So what you do, if you're using Mac, hold the command key, but if you're using Windows, hold the control key. 
So I'll bring down my command key. Now I'll click on my mouse button. That will then select the next layer behind it. If I click again, that will select the layer behind that. And now, as you can see, that layer is selected. I can do whatever I want to it, like changing colors, just like that. One of the other features I love about Canva is that they have a range of book covers or ebook covers. If you simply search for ebook cover, you'll see a range of these ebook covers right here. If you load up any of the ebook covers, you'll see here you can edit it and do whatever you want. However, the issue then is that you're stuck with this 2D flat looking book cover. To make it look more realistic like an actual book cover, you can use a tool called Smart Mockup. Thankfully, Canva does integrate with Smart Mockup, and here's how to do it. From the top, you'll see an option for Smart Mockup. Click on Smart Mockup, click on Save, and what that'll do is publish it. Go to smartmockups.com and sign up for a free account or upgrade for more design. Once you're in, go to All Mockups, and from the left, you'll see here magazines and books. Choose a mock-up style. Now, you are limited depending on what level of plan you are. For this demo, I'm going to choose one of the free options. You can see the pro ones have a lock icon there. Let's choose this one. On the book cover, you see Upload From. Select that. Choose Canva. And now I can see my template loaded there. From here, you can crop your image. Sometimes it may not fit, so just adjust it the way you want. Click on Crop and Continue. And now it's on the actual mock-up. I can also customize the background here. And once done, I can download it and use it for my website. The next tip I want to share with you is adding a shadow effect. It's as simple as selecting the text, going to effects and choosing shadow, and there you have the shadow. Now you can make finer adjustments such as the color of the shadow. So let's say white. You can change the direction and the angle of your shadow. You can also change the transparency of it. Next tip is quite fundamental and will be handy no matter what you are designing on Canva. And that is moving certain elements. To really fine tune the elements on your design, all you need to do is just use your arrows on your keyboard. And I'm simply pressing up and down, or you can hold the key left and right. Now that's going to only move it one pixel at a time. You can hold the shift key on your keyboard and move it so that it moves 10 pixels at a time like so. Next up, I want to show you how to add a gradient to the background of any image. So simply go to elements, search for gradient. What you want to look for is the square, so I'm going to select that. That's going to apply it to your design. I'm just going to drag it so that it starts in the corner there, and then drag it from the corner. From here, you can change the colors by looking at the top left, changing the first color. I'll just change it to yellow, and the secondary color to orange. And as you can see, now we've got the gradient effect. You can also make the gradient start the other way. So click on flip, flip horizontally. Now this is vertical. If you want it going horizontally, just use the rotate feature and like so. A really simple way to add text. Instead of going to text and then choosing from there, is to simply hit the T button on your keyboard. And from there, you can change the sizes and do whatever you want to it. Next up, if you use specific colors on a regular basis, it's wise to use their brand kit so that you can refer back to it. Like mine right here, I've got some colors that you can see here. That's my color palette based on my branding. All you need to do, if you are on the design, you can click on add another palette or from the home page, click on brand kit. From here, click on add new palette. Select all the colors that you want. Once it's added, give it a name. To start using your brand colors, simply select an element, let's say this text, then go to the color, and now you can see the new color palette added. Now I can select whatever colors I want based on those colors. For the next tip, what I want to share with you is instead of uploading your files to your uploads and clicking upload an image or video, all you really need to do is open your folder. I've got mine here, drag and drop it. And that's pretty much it. This is a more intuitive method of doing it and it will save you a heap of time. For this next tip, I want to show you how to duplicate or clone certain or specific elements. Let's take this heart element as an example. Select it and we can simply go and duplicate it and drag it wherever we want. Now, there is a shortcut for this. All you need to do on your keyboard for Mac users, Command-D or Windows, Control-D. 
And just like that, I duplicated that element. An even faster method is to hold the Option key on your Mac or Alt key, I think, on the Windows. And then using your mouse, you just drag and that'll clone it. The next tip is zooming in and zooming out. Sometimes the elements and the canvas look quite small on screen. So what you want to do is use the zoom feature. You can either use it from here by selecting the percentage, or you can use the command key on the Mac or control on the Windows system, and then plus minusing on your keyboard like so. My favorite way to do it is holding the command key and scrolling up and down using my mouse. Okay, next tip is grouping text or elements. Let's say I want to group these two elements right here. All I need to do really is just select the first element, holding the shift key on my keyboard, then selecting the second element. And let's say this icon here or this element, clicking again, and now that's all grouped together. And now what I want to do is click on the group option, and now that's grouped together. So now when I move this anywhere, it is all grouped together and it won't lose its position. To ungroup it, simply select any of those elements and click on ungroup and you're done. All right, the next tip is cropping. Because Canva doesn't have an eraser tool, we need to be able to just use the cropping feature. So click on the element you want to crop, click on crop once you've selected it. And from here, we can now use the drag option to crop it where we want. So let's say halfway here, click on done, and now it's cropped. Now for this next tip, we are going to filter based on free or Canva Pro elements. So by selecting the filter icon at the top here, once we're in elements, we can choose whether it's free or pro elements that we want to search for. So let's say free, now apply the filters, search for what we want. And now these are all the free elements that we can select rather than having the pro elements together. The next tip I want to share with you is filtering by color. So all you need to do is search for whatever element you want first. So I'll search for sunglasses here and from the filters, I'll then select the color that I want. So let's say I only want red sunglasses, I'll select the red color, apply filters. And as you can see, these are all the elements I can use based on red sunglasses. Next up is hyperlinking certain text so that if you are saving it as a PDF, for example, you want your viewer or customer to be able to click on a specific text, then this may be handy. So let's zoom into this particular text here. And let's say we want this line of text to be hyperlinked. I'll just select it and clicking on the link icon, I'll then enter my URL. Click on apply, and now this is linked. Here's a PDF we downloaded, and if we click on the hyperlink, we're then taken to our link. Next up, I want to teach you how to use templates. This is especially useful if you have some social media templates that you usually use, let's say you create quotes and you stick to one design or a couple of designs. This is how you are going to save some time. Let's say this is my finished template. All I need to do is just save it here. Scroll down to your find template. Click on template, add the template to a specific folder. So let's say your marketing folder, click on select folder, publish the template, and now it's added to your template. To use your template for next time, you can find the folder here, or go to all your folders, and you'll find your folder there. Select the template, click on it, and either choose use this template or edit original. Obviously, you just want to use this template, not edit the original. Click on use this template. Now it's loaded from the template, and you can freely edit it without affecting the original template. Moving on to the next step, what I want to share with you is perfect alignment. How do you align text and all sorts of elements so that it is perfectly aligned? Let me first share with you the first way. Now, you want to center the text. It's hard to know what where the center is. Let me share with you the first way. For this text here, let's say we want that dead set in the middle. All we need to do is just go to position, click on the middle, then to the center, and there you have it. That's right in the middle. Second way to perfectly align elements and text is to go to File, turn on Show Rulers, from the ruler, you want to just drag using your mouse, set where you want your text or elements to start, and then start dragging your element, and you can see that it's lined right there. I'll also align the other heading. To remove the guide, all you need to do is just use your mouse again and drag it away. 
Next up, I want to show you how to remove backgrounds using Canva. However, side note, this is a Canva Pro feature, but let's say I have this image right here and I want to remove the background on this. Simply hit Effects once selected, click on Background Remover, and in just a matter of seconds, you'll see the background removed. Now I can use this image for my YouTube yeah. thumbnails or so any cool. other marketing <laughs> thumbnails. Oh, Next up, what I want to show you is how to create that highlight or stroke effect around yourself. And you may have seen this in many YouTube thumbnails. Here's how to do it. Select your image and we're going to make a copy. And we're going to work on the back layer here. Choosing effect. Make sure you select view and tone. And choose any of the effects since we are going to change the color anyway. Select again. For the highlight, just select white. For the shadows, select white as well. And we are going to change the background first, so obviously stand up, choosing my color here. Next up, with your main image, you want to put it over. And from here, we're going to resize it just a tad. And we can get away with that, but if you want, you can also move it with your arrows. And now you've got the highlight effect that now you can use on your thumbnail. Next tip I want to share with you is Canvas frames. So if we search for frames, selecting one of the frames, let's say this screen here, I'm going to resize this a bit. You'll see a placeholder image. This means that if you upload or drag any image here, it'll only show the photo based on the frame. So for example, let's go to uploads and choosing one of these images here. Let's say this one here, I'll just drag it. And as you can see, it's automatically cropped the image to fit the frame. To select a different part of that photo, simply double tap or double click and then move across. All right, so there we go. If you learned a thing or two, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe if you're new. Make sure to turn on notifications too so that you don't miss out on any tips, tools, and training post up here on this channel. Thanks so much for. He has all kinds on YouTube. So it was just that easy because we are using Canva to create this, and then we could just upload that um, URL and put it in there and then have it play. So, yep. Mary. Yes, sorry. Yep. Yeah. 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 Leah Marie. <laughs> he has, like, he had, like, a green screen. Yes. Yeah. It gets harder the more busy your image is. Right. But right. so, like, if you were to do it in front of this wall or right. able to color yeah. it yourself, then okay. right. you could remove it right from there. Yeah. Very snazzy. Okay, and these are some of the pro features. Here is our our set. Yes. <laughs> 170,000 premium templates. Um, branding your, you know, a brand kit. There's a background yes. tool, um, remover tool. There's animating your designs, the ability to export designs with transparent backgrounds, which I'll let so Val kind of, yeah. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, even watching that video ourselves, I was like, oh my gosh, I did not realize that. You know what I mean? That yeah. we've not been saving them to certain folders and we're getting a lot of them now. I'm like, okay, now we're going to need to start <laughs> saying that one for the web page. This one's for, you know, for summer library program, whatever it might be. So, yeah. And I believe the brand kit, you just upload your library's logo in yep. there and bam, anytime you need it, or yep. there's a space where your logo should be. Yep. You can be like, oh, look, it logo. It right there. Yep. It'll add it right, it right where it needs to be. So that's really handy. And all of this animation, I know that a lot of times, you know, we, we kind of, that's why we did this is because the pros and the cons, because a lot of people are going to say, well, I can use PowerPoint that comes with, you know, off the suite, we can just do that. Um, so some of the pros, I kind of looked up and found out um, statistics because we librarians are all about statistics. So <laughs> we want to kind of find out um, the pros of it is it's simple. It's um, minimal features, a nice selection of preloaded fonts, drag and drop functionality. That's the one that he was doing the tip. I keep uploading all of my photos. Yeah. I was like, I didn't know I should just open my folder and put it in there. So yeah, you learn, I learned something today too. So, and then price and the branding. So I'll let Valerie share the cons. <laughs> um, some people would say that it's too simple. They don't have enough control with it. Like with you, when you would on Photoshop or something. Wow, 
not everybody needs all that. I don't need all that. <laughs> it's a lot. Of, so the maximum slide you can have with this is 30, but I don't know many times you need a whole lot more than 30. Yeah. So <laughs> not <laughs> not okay. like more than 30. Slides. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's missing favorite features. From so, PowerPoint, yes. Yeah, some yeah. people have, you know. Like, oh. Well, well yes. I mean, I want to find out how he made his own YouTube, though. Like, with the full circular face there talking as he's doing it. I'm like, I need to find out how to do that <laughs> so we can upload that. Yes. But, um, yeah. And um, I know that there are things that people are used to with PowerPoint. And I know that one of the things that I've always liked is the transition from slide to slide. You know, you, you can do it like where you swipe or where you mm -hmm. make a bounce in. Those are some things that you are limited on, but this was actually yeah, a template. Too. This move, I didn't even have to do this. It was like one of the templates. Belle's like, how'd you do that? And I'm like, it was a template. Yes. <laughs> it just fit cool. And we made, you know, we dragged it and made it larger until we thought it kind of would keep your eyes moving. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and yeah. inserting videos is kind of, it's not like their greatest thing right now. Yeah. Just like it was, you're inserting it, then you gotta open it, and then you gotta close it, and then yeah, open the presentation again. It's right. kind of inconvenient, but it's still pretty. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, I guess while we're doing this, you can sort of see what they're talking about because normally you could just click on you know, the arrow and then that would just start the video and you would just hit the enlarge, but then your presentation would keep going. But I feel like for what, it's offering because I've had to, like I said, create way too many backgrounds and move this and all that in PowerPoint. So this one is just a real time saver, especially if you're creating things for your boards or, you know what I mean? When you want to share your ideas with them and this will be a great thing, you know, if you're wanting to put in a new book corner or you're, you know, wanting to write a grant or something, just think about being able to put this on, you know, all of this printed out and then hand it to them in a folder and be like, I've already got that all set. This is what we're thinking of doing. And they'll be like, wow, she's got her stuff together. You know, it does make it look very professional. And we're kind of at a, a, like a spot. This is where towards the end of it now, what we were wanting to do is that, um, kind of start from the beginning, but that would mean that you would need to have your phone and be able to um, put the app on your phone. So it is something that, you know, we would love for you to do, but we understand, you know, we might be running out of time at this point to kind of kind of do the whole thing. So we're sorry about that, but at least when we, we're gonna send this out to everyone. So you can just go step-by-step step right through it. Um, so that, you know, it is a little bit easier. And like I said, every video that we chose other than um, the last gentleman, they were all on Canva itself. So you could go to every one of their design tips and, and there are tons out there on YouTube of how, how to use it because everyone's using it right now. Yes. <laughs> so that's a good thing. All righty. Yep. Do we have any questions? No? Is this to, can we create videos or edit videos to Canva or is it just graphic design? I think you can. Yeah, I think you can to a, a certain level. Um, I know when I've uploaded it, it kind of can, allows me to do a little bit of playing with it. But like I said, that is one of the limited things that it does say, you know what I mean? That there's only so much you can do with the videos. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah, I, I haven't really played with that a lot. I mean, to me, it's still pretty new because there's just so much to it. I mean, we've been using it, I think about, I, I, I think just about a year. Yep, I would say so. And yeah, we've done a ton of things with it. And like I said, I just think that even looking at our Facebook page or looking mm -hmm. at our um, web page now, it's just, it's changed everything about yes. it. It just has much more of a professional feel. You're not like, I can't really see what she has written there. You know what I mean? Because sometimes you couldn't see it as clear as it is. And even doing these presentations, I've done PowerPoint ones up here where it's like, oh, that's kind of grainy. I can't really see that. So you can see how clear it is on every screen. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, are there any other questions? Is all this, uh, you're putting that on our, our virtual slide space as well. You're using that there as well. <coughs> The graphics I have made for a lot of people. So like I put their library name on there and some cool colors that match all the other stuff I found to put on there. And some of them move. I believe St. Francis is it's got some yeah, graphics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm getting more into the whole 
moving bits every once in a while. I got the <coughs> colors all down. You have to check library etiquette on website for the disabled and the blind yes. and yes. the people yes. with yes. epilepsy. Right. right. Yes, you're right. Um, okay. Mary, one thing I like with it is you can design one for Facebook, then you can also send it out on Twitter. Right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just and one click to do a different uh, platform. Didn't she also time yours? Like you set it so that it could it would do it because you can set it yep. to do Schedule. it at a certain time. But I thought it's where they went. Yes, I have done that. Yeah. I don't do it a lot, but yeah. sometimes, okay, I've you've got it prepared now, but you don't want people to know about it till eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes. <laughs> you know, so you set it so it will come on at that time. Yeah, yeah perfect. Yep. Yeah, it was cute because when we first offered it, like we sent out what we the first ones that we chose were the people that I saw that were using their Facebook page. I mean, like a lot of posts. So I was always liking all of their things. So we offered the first five to those people that were using it the most. And so I remember reaching out to you guys and you're like, I've never done this. And then within like two weeks, Steve had tons of stuff. I'm like, oh, here you go. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's it. You were a novice and just started and it's it yeah, really, fun it to learn. really it's easy, easy to do. Yep. And any other, Nate, you have a question? Uh, are you able to save like these documents and like, um, you know, save it as something that you can just save on your desktop? Mm -hmm. and, 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 yeah. Yep. And then, um, you know, too, like you can um, basically have it, send it to Facebook and stuff like that. Can you make it so if you send it to your own website as well? Uh, I haven't done the website, I but I either. I think it depends on yeah. the type of oh, yeah. yeah. app you what, yeah, what you're website. using. Because it does give you quite a few of op um, options as to what to do with it or where to share it. Uh -huh. Because I know we just linked it to our, um, you know, our Facebook page, but it did allow you to link it to a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. It might very well, but I'm only thinking in my head, you know, it won't know where to go. So on your web page, if you have a there's widget, probably somewhere. right? Yeah, yeah. With there a widget is. You have this, yeah. Um, there is. Yeah. It's just a matter of I don't have all my website. Yeah. <laughs> so <I'm gonna> <laughs> yeah. Website. But, yes. No, and well, you know, if you have questions and you're using it or you want to try using it, then please ask us because we enjoy playing with yes. it. So we'll figure out what the answer is yes. and try to find it. So I feel like we're the two that have used it the most yes. and really are enjoying it. So and don't be afraid of it because I know people. They like that it looks nicer than like, oh, back in the day, people were using like Word and stuff to create graphics. And so now it's like a whole ball different, you know, ballpark. It's all different. Yeah. And I don't know if all of our member librarians and um, people that are joining us today know that Val is our new tech assistant for Dave. So she has been awesome. So I'm sure Dave will be like, <laughs> because yeah, she has just taken this and run with it. So it's made it really fun for all of us and nice. So thank you so much. And we're sorry about our glitches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anything you need that has to do with Verso, websites, uh, Canva. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, Valerie, I shouldn't have said it. <laughs> Anything else Dave doesn't want to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and I, I will try my best I'm still learning her so myself. So <laughs> boy, did he just throw her under that yeah. bus and ran her over and I did it again. Yeah. <laughs> she gets stuck. She knows that she's I do. Yep. I'm still learning, so bear with me. <laughs> Dial on that. Now, yeah, I passed that mine. Yeah, yes, I think that's it. Any for other us. questions? Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>
warn you all now I don't do very well standing still so I'm all the way over in that corner talking to the wall just somebody wave at me and make me turn back around um, my name is Philip Michael I'm an assistant attorney general I work in the legal opinions and government counsel division of attorney general Derek Schmidt's office long way around to saying one of the things I do is I go around the state and I give these kinds of presentations I talk about open records I talk about open meetings I'm also the person for good and bad that if somebody calls the attorney general's office to complain about some government entity not doing what they're supposed to, I'm usually the one they end up talking to first. So a couple caveats. Anything you hear from me or my opinions and my opinions alone, I do not speak on behalf of General Schmidt. He's this tall guy. He speaks pretty well for himself. Yeah. All right, am I on? Let me do this. How about now? All right, how about now? No, yes, no. I, I can hear the thing now. How about now? Any luck? All right, how about now? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, I can walk around with it like this. Um, I think that's what I'm going to have to do. Um, so, as I said, my name is Philip Michael. I'm an assistant attorney general. I work in the legal opinions and government counsel division of Attorney General Derek Schmidt's office. This is kind of weird. We're going to try this. How about now? Okay. It'll keep me from going in and out and driving you all crazy. Um, so, I do these presentations. Um, before COVID, I used to go around the state quite a few times a year. During COVID, I did a lot of these via Zoom and WebEx and figured out how to not do this right. Um, figured out how to get so people can't ask questions, figured out how to accidentally turn off my own computer in the middle of one of these, um, <laughs> et cetera. So we're gonna talk a little bit about open meetings and a little bit about open records because uh, the honest answer is all of you work for an entity that's gonna be subject to both coma and both CORA. So, as I said, anything you hear from me or my opinions, my opinions alone, General Schmitz is tall guy, he talks very well for himself. So I also cannot speak about any pending litigation. And I can't speak about any pending investigation. A couple of reasons. One, I don't do them. I don't know anything about them. And two, it's our office policy that we don't talk about pending investigations or pending litigation. So all that fun stuff out of the way, we're gonna talk about the Open Meetings Act first. The Open Meetings Act or Coma is found at 754317 at SEC in your statutes. So I told you that when people call, I'm the ones that they talk to at the Attorney General's office usually. So a lot of the issues I hear related to the Open Meetings Act deal with this idea of executive session. So all of you have a library board that might go into executive session. Everything from a proper motions for executive session. We'll go into exactly what you have to do to do the motion. It's oddly confusing, even though maybe it shouldn't be. I'm going to blame the legislature. As with all things I say, I don't like, we're going to blame the legislature. Calling an executive session for one reason, subject or justification, and talking about something completely different when you get there. Inclusion of non commissioner council members in an executive session, extending an executive session, or reconvening an executive session early without going through the formal motion process. There's no mechanism in the Open Meetings Act to extend an executive session without a formal motion. It's also no mechanism to come back early. We'll talk about all this. Revealing information discussed in executive session is a big one. I get a lot of phone calls about this. And the reason I get a lot of phone calls about this is because the Open Meetings Act doesn't care. It doesn't govern this. So you can have somebody in that executive session who can immediately walk back out and tell every member of the public everything that went on in that executive session and it is not in violation of the Open Meetings Act. Like I said, it may be frustrating for anybody who sits on those boards, anybody that's in that executive session, but it is not governed by the Open Meetings Act. So I talk to folks a lot about that. I've been called more than one man. It is, in addition to executive sessions, we're going to try a little bit lower. I'm setting this thing on. Okay. 
All right, can we still hear this at all? Yeah. Okay. So in addition to executive sessions, we have this idea of serial communications, and we'll talk about what this means, but in the age of interactive communication methods, this is a more potential issue. Think of email reply all social media posts, those kinds of things. Also, a majority of the membership of a public body gathered together without notice. This is really common in small towns, um, such as the one I grew up in. And second week I was on the job, I got a phone call from somebody who wanted to complain about the city council all being gathered together in the same place without notice. The more I let this person talk, the more I find out they all happen to belong to the same church. And they all happened that week, even though they weren't even interacting with each other, to be sitting in the same row seats. It's probably not going to be a violation of the Open Meeting Act. Simply being in one place at one time is not enough. Simple stuff, failure to provide notice. And we'll, we'll talk about all this as we go. So the idea of open meetings has been around as long as the state of Kansas. You'll see the statute in front of you. Can I say 19 to 18? States every board of county commissioners shall sit with open doors and all persons conducting themselves in an orderly manner may attend their meetings. This was put in place in 1868. It was last amended in the 20s. Still on the books today, still good law. So the Kansas Open Meetings Act, everything that we're all covered by now, was put in place in the 1970s, 1972 specifically. So this provides rules that allows members of the public to attend or observe meetings of all of the units of government in the state of Kansas. We have 3,793 or so units of government in the state of Kansas. I want you to think of library boards. I want you to think of school districts. I want you to think of all government agencies like executive branch agencies, universities, community colleges, watershed districts, cemetery districts, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. Like I said, we have 3,793. That ranks the sixth nationally in terms of total units of government, or about 35th or 36th in terms of total population. So one way, or for one reason or another, we have a lot of government in the state of Kansas. Illinois is first at about 7,000. Hawaii ranks last, which is 21. The reason why I tell you all that is this involves a lot of folks, not just folks that get paid to have to do this, a lot of boards, have just volunteer members. They're all still subject to the same rules under the Open Meetings Act and under the Open Records Act as everybody else. So the whole point of COMA, and I forgot to tell you all something before we started. At any point, if anybody has any questions, please do raise your hand, shout them out, get my attention, or just yell over me. Because I want to talk about the stuff that's more important to you guys than just listen to myself talk. At this point, I've done so many of these, I already know what I'm going to say. So I'd rather hear your questions and talk about things that matter to you. Yes, sir. What happens if you don't hold, conduct the meeting correctly? If you don't conduct the meeting correctly, you're going to be talking to somebody else that works in my office that does investigations and comes in and finds you. How are they going to find out about it? Somebody has to file a complaint. Um, and you would be amazed at how frequent people like to file complaints. I believe we're on pace this month to set our all-time record for complaints filed. So. Any person can file a complaint if your entity doesn't follow these rules, or if they think your entity isn't following so, these rules. So, uh, if, for instance, if a member of the public comes in and they don't think that the mayor is uh, conducting the meeting correctly, they can file a complaint? They certainly can. If they believe that they're in violation of the Open Meetings Act, they can file an open meetings complaint with either my office or with their county attorney, either one. And what I can tell you right now is, I think we had 15 complaints last week, which was a record for last week. Um, and it can be everything from they didn't provide notice to me, even though I asked for it, to they held the meeting at the wrong time. It can be all kinds of stuff. And oftentimes it is all kinds of stuff. Whole point of Coma. Pardon. So how long does it take to follow through on this complaint? Depending on the severity of the complaint. Depending on the severity and depending on the action of the person filing the complaint wants. Um, if they are wanting to stop or reverse an action that took place at that meeting, those need to the top of the list because there's a time line that has to be followed to get those done quickly. I believe it's 21 days, I think. Um, all of them will be acted on as quickly as possible. We are staffed with a certain number of human beings and not an excess number of human beings to do the job. Put it that way on their behalf for the folks that are doing this. Yeah. And, and I want you to clarify one thing for me. Absolutely. So here, um, that, well, we don't have to do that because we're a small town. 
<laughs> All right. I have had 15 calls this month from a small town of less than 100 people. They are as subject to it as the largest city in the state of Kansas. I know almost every person in that town is there. <laughs> so there you go. So it does not matter the size of your town. It does not matter the size of your unit of government. It doesn't matter. You're still subject to the Open Meetings Act and you're still subject to the Open Records Act. What is considered notification and what is the we'll, timeline? We'll discuss notification here in the school day in, in detail. It's not as encompassing as you might think. The Open Meetings Act kind of sets the floor for what folks have to do. You can always do more, but it sets the baseline. Whole point of coma. Meeting shall be open to the public because a representative government is dependent upon an informed electorate. So this is a law that was enacted for the public benefit. Everything about coma is going to be construed broadly towards the idea of openness. So anything a unit of government does to limit citizens' access to observe or attend a meeting has to be very narrowly tailored to a specific statutorily allowed purpose. And the burden rests entirely on that unit of government to prove why that meeting was closed or why they had that executive session or why they didn't call a meeting. So if you get nothing else out of coma, the burden to prove you follow the law is entirely on you as a unit of government. Who's subject to coma? Well, everybody, basically. All legislative and administrative bodies and agencies of the state, as well as all political and taxing subdivisions thereof. Also, subordinate groups. And subordinate groups are not defined in statute. So that would be too easy. We're going to blame the legislature. Okay? So subordinate groups. I want you to think of if your governing body has formed a group. So is that group going to be considered to be a subordinate group for purposes of coma? So I want you to think of how is that group created? Who creates it? How is it funded? How does it function? Does it do something that would be considered to be a traditional government function? Does it make decisions on behalf of your governing body? What kind of authority does it have? It doesn't matter what we call a subordinate group. It's all about what that group does. So whether or not something is a subordinate group is going to be a case-by-case, -case, fact intensive analysis. I wish I could tell you there was a specific test. There isn't. There's just a number of factors that various court cases across the decades have kind of come up with. So all state bodies are subject to coma. That means the legislature, its committees and its subcommittees, unless the legislature has rules that would exempt some of their committees and subcommittees. And they do. Um, the House rules and Senate rules both exempt certain of their subcommittees from the rules of the Open Meetings Act. All state administrative bodies, boards, and commissions, such as executive branch agencies, the Office of the Attorney General, the Treasurer's Office, the Board of Education, et cetera, all of those are subject to the Open Meetings Act. The state Board of Regents, as well as Regents institutions, all of your universities, all of your colleges in the state of Kansas are subject to the Open Meetings Act. Supreme Court Nominating Commission, as well. So for local governments, it's your cities, your counties, townships, school districts, fire districts, library boards, water districts, et cetera. We went through this great big list of 3,793 entities. As of 2017, I don't have more numbers. So. It doesn't mean everybody is subject to coma. An otherwise covered entity, when exercising a quasi-judicial function, is not going to be subject to the Open Meetings Act. So I want you to think of a county zoning board when they're deliberating about a specific property. So the deliberations are not subject to coma. Their decision is. But while they're discussing whether or not something is going to be zoned this way or that way, it would not be subject to coma. State civil service board hearings are not subject to coma when they're about a specific employee. So an otherwise covered entity when they're exercising this quasi-judicial or deliberation function are not subject to coma. Also, hearings that are conducted under the Kansas Administrative Procedures Act or CAPA are not subject to coma. CAPA only applies to those agencies or entities that have specific statutory authority to use CAPA. It doesn't apply broadly. So if you don't have a statute that says you have to use CAPA, then this does not apply to you. The judiciary, likewise, is not covered by the coma. If you think of core proceedings, those are their own process. They're not a coma open meeting. Private organizations generally are not going to be subject to coma. I've lost count of the number of phone calls I've gotten from somebody who was unhappy with their homeowners association. 
they are not a government agency. They are common interest owners association. So they are governed under the rules of that association. All rights you have against that homeowners association are based on the fact that you own a home and you're a part of that association. So Coma can't help you, Cora can't help you. Don't call me and tell me that they aren't holding their meetings in accordance with Cora or with Coma. I'm gonna say I'm sorry. Also a reason why I don't live in a homeowners association. I'm way too argumentative. <laughs> also, I've heard people try to use that with churches. Exactly. The same thing, right? Exactly. It's a private organization. It's not a governmental entity. So if it's not a public agency, then these don't apply. You certainly could act under coma. I, you don't have to. You don't have to. That, that, that was a good. That's good. I forgot that one. Also, staff meetings of a covered entity are generally not going to be subject to the Open Meetings Act. So unless the majority of the membership of your governing body attend and participate in that staff meeting, you're not going to be subject to coma. So if it's just staff of your agency, you're probably fine. To be a meeting under the Open Meetings Act, it has to have all three of these factors you see in front of you, not two, not one, all three. It has to be all three. So in a gathering or assembly, either in person through the use of a telephone or any other medium for interactive communication, such as say on Skype, WebEx, any of a thousand other online communication platforms. That's factor one. Two is by a majority of the membership of the public body or agency subject to the act. And I'm gonna go through each one of these a little bit more carefully. And three, the one that really matters, the one that truly does matter is for the purpose of discussing a business work is the public body or you can have pretty much the entire the entirety of the membership of your governing body or board in the same room all day long. If you're talking about baseball and the world is great this year, it's probably not going to violate the Open Meetings Act. Mm -hmm. But somehow they managed to turn that into a discussion about your public body and the work of your public body, and that's where you run into your issues. So it's a discussion for me that's the big trigger. So that gathering or assembly, like I told you, it doesn't matter how you meet, as so long as you meet. Um, the world we live in now, and the world that we figured out how to live in over COVID. Virtual meetings absolutely can comply with the idea of gathering for purposes of the Open Meetings Act. This also includes informal discussions before the meeting, during the meeting, during the recess of the meeting, after the meeting is over. So if your governing body standing out in the parking lot after you're done, and they're still talking about the business or affairs of the public body, that's still potentially not meeting. Same as if they're doing it before the meeting happens or if they're gathered outside by the water fountain during recess. All of these times are still potentially a meeting. You run the issue of being outside of the notice period of your meeting if they're continuing it before and after the recess of the meeting. Also, doesn't matter what you call the gathering. You can call it a work session, you can call it a study group. If you have all three of the factors that we've been talking about, then this is a meeting for purposes of the Open Meetings Act. The majority of the membership should be the easiest factor. I want you to think the total number of members that sit on your governing board, including empty positions, is half plus one. So if you have seven total members, that number is four. It doesn't have to be a quorum. They changed that law back in 2008, 2009, where it was used to state majority of the quorum. But currently, all you have to have is the majority of your public body. First of all, she doesn't know it yet, but she is so grounded. So that third factor, the one I told you that I feel is the most important is discussion. Keep in mind for our purposes here, discussion doesn't mean that this has to end in a binding action or both. Simply having a discussion on a permissible topic or a topic related to the business or affairs of the public body is enough. I told you that this is all stages of the gathering process, including before the meeting, during the meeting, during recess, after the meeting has concluded. Now there's this idea of social gatherings. I told you those first two factors, the gathering and by a majority can happen all day long and it's not a problem. So if the majority of your public body is gathered together in a social function, they can do that all they want. It just triggers when they start talking about stuff they're not supposed to talk about unless they're in an open meeting setting. So simply having a social gathering or being present at a social gathering is not a violation in and of itself. Retreats and meetings held in private, I would argue differently. One of the biggest points of the Open Meetings Act is that members of the public can observe and attend your meeting free of charge. So if you have a meeting at a place that requires either membership in order to gain access or a fee to gain access, that is directly in violation of the Open Meetings Act. You have to allow members of the public to attend or observe 
for you. They have to actually be able to get into where you are meeting. Educational conferences and seminars, generally going to be completely fine. As long as it's general education. So if it's topics related to all libraries, you're going to be fine. If it's topics related only to your specific library, is where you might run into an issue because it's not general education at that point. It is discussion about the business or affairs of your public body alone. General education is completely fine. So once upon a time, we used to do these shows around the state where we get a panel of folks that was set up here. Some would be from the media, some would be from county attorney's offices and those kinds of things. And we would do a discussion. And one of the time, one of the topics went to what happens when your governing body is traveling to and from me, say so they're going together in a car. Well, what's the story going to be? Well, this one media person very honestly on the panel said, well, the story is going to be they're all riding in the same car together. Nobody can hear. They must be having a meeting. However, he did honestly say, he said, to be completely honest, they all ride separately. My story is going to waste tax your dollars by all driving them separately. <laughs> so just keep in mind, simply not violating the law doesn't mean you're always going to have good optics or good story. So I had a question about notice. You had a question about notice? OK, now, under the Open Meetings Act, it is a really low bar. There's no requirement under the Open Meetings Act to post notice of meetings on either a web page, a newspaper, or anywhere else. All you have to do, all the public agency is required to do under the Open Meetings Act is to provide notice to those individuals that have requested to receive okay, notice. I said that because I thought I should, but okay, I was wrong, and you're right. I see those individuals that have requested to receive that notice. Now, there's no formalities under the law that are, a lot, that are required for somebody to make that request for notice. They can have it verbally or they can do it writing to you. Does that make you feel better? If you no. want fiscal year, and they can make a request. But at the end of that fiscal year, you as a public agency have to reach back out to them to inquire whether they want to continue receiving that notice or not. But that is all that you're truly required to do under the Open Meetings Act. Now, you can certainly do more. You might have your governing rules that require you to do more. But the Open Meetings Act just sets that low bar. And that notice does have to have three things. You have to provide the date, the time, and the location where the public body is going to meet to the person or persons requesting to receive that notice. And you have to provide that to them a reasonable time before your meeting. And once again, we're going to blame the legislature because they didn't define what reasonable time means. So I want you to think of if you have a normally scheduled meeting, say you meet monthly or you meet weekly or whatever, your notice might be a much longer period out than if you have something that requires immediate attention in a short period of time, say an emergency. So an emergency meeting, what is reasonable there might be a shorter window than if it is your normally scheduled meeting. If you have a group of individuals that have requested to receive notice of your meeting, you do as a public body get to require them to designate one person to receive that notice so you don't have to send out 300 letters or 300 emails to a large group. So if you were an executive branch agency, I would spend a lot of time talk, talking about public square. Um, so publicsquare.ks.gov, executive branch agencies are required to do a little bit more than everybody else when it comes to notice. All executive branch agencies pursuant to executive order are required to post their meeting minutes and notice to the Public Square website. Now, when I do these for executive branch agencies, I used to make the mistake of asking folks if they knew what this website was. I almost never got hands raised because nobody was actually using this correctly for about the first year it was in place. So I don't ask anybody anymore because I don't want to get them in trouble. But I do want to remind them where they can go to gain access to it and how they can log on and that kind of stuff. But since you folks aren't subject to it, we won't go down that road. I do have to tell you all about penalties. I'm going to tell you about penalties for Coma here. And here in a little bit, we're going to talk about penalties to COIL. It's not my favorite part. I'd like to think that people call me before they've made a mistake, and then you don't have to deal with this aspect of it. Under the Open Meetings Act, there's a civil penalty of up to $500 for each violation paid by each individual member of your governing body that knowingly violates the Open Meetings Act. I'm going to call the note. This is paid by that individual person, by that member of your governing body. It's not paid by your agency. It is paid by that person who has violated the law. There can be a required completion of attorney general approved and or provided training, such as this. There can be orders to cease and desist from further violations. They do have to agree to comply with the Open Meetings Act going forward. And there can be ordered to be paid, uh, ordered to pay reasonable expenses, including investigation costs and attorney's fees. 
I will note that when my office does investigation, we view this in a cumulative manner. Say it's your first mistake, more than likely you're going to be stuck listening to me, which is painful enough, I know. Uh, my wife can tell you this, um, my cat can tell you this, and I can tell you this. But that first time is probably going to be trained. That's what we would usually recommend. It's the second and third time, and the fourth time, and the fifth time where you're going to start giving us money to pay for me to come and do these trainings or to pay somebody else to come and do a training for you. So like I said, we prefer to do training because we figure that's probably more important to show you how to do things correctly and to answer your questions. So if anybody ever has any question, I'm gonna give you my contact info at the end. Um, please do reach out to me and just ask. That is why I am there. So we mentioned earlier, one of the other areas I get a lot of calls about are serial communication. The serial communications are difficult because they're incredibly hard to prove one way or the other. So I want you to think of an interactive communication outside of a notice meeting that collectively involves a majority of the membership of your public body, shares a common topic of discussion, and it's intended by any or all of the members of your governing body to come to a conclusion that requires a binding vote that should necessarily be taken in open meeting. So I want you to think of chain emails. So say, staff of a public body sends to your governing body an email and they're all on the email say so one of them replies all okay i don't love it but it's not necessarily a violation say the second one replies all how, what, what, how many do you have on your governing body at this point the third one replies all the fourth one replies all the fifth one replies all next thing you know you had a meeting you violated your requirements under the open meetings act you violated the notice provision and you've gotten in trouble this has come up with our office fairly frequently lately in terms of Facebook posts. And you think of the comment section on a Facebook post. You have a governing body member who posts something on Facebook and you have another governing body member who responds to their post and another one who responds to their post. This happened in a county not that long ago. They got in a little bit of trouble. You had a meeting. Um, social media, which was not necessarily contemplated by the Open Meetings Act when it was put in place back in the 70s. A lot of stuff wasn't contemplated by the Open Meetings Act when it was put in place back in the 70s. All these things still apply. The idea of call increase, where you may have one calls two, two calls four, and so on and so forth, also potentially violate the Open Meetings Act here, creates a serial communication. And a big one, and one that is almost impossible to prove, and I really hate when people call me about this because I, I wish I could help them more, is when a governing body is using a staff person as an agent or an intermediary. This is where you have somebody that sits on a governing body that goes to an employee and says, I want you to go to these two commissioners and come back and tell me their answer. Or go tell them I said this and get their answer and bring it back to me. That is the same as a meeting, and it's putting a staff person in a difficult position. But it's also very hard to prove. All of these things could be potentially serial communications. One thing I need you to know here, simply being on that email chain doesn't mean that that one governing body person has violated the law if they never responded. So it does require a um, mutual exchange. So it has to have somebody actually adding to the conversation. So simply being on that email chain is not enough to get somebody in trouble. It's when they're part of the ones forwarding it all or replying all or sending to other folks. I apologize if I come across a little lecture. The last one of these I did was for folks that were ordered to get the training. <laughs> um, so it's a different mindset where I got to do this a lot. So I'm going to so absolutely so if your board is using text to make a decision say to set up a meeting mm -hmm. a meeting that is so is that let's, let's talk about meeting scheduling meeting scheduling is not going to usually be considered a meeting so are you available on x date is usually not going to be a problem because setting up a meeting our office has oak pine is not a meeting in and of itself and it's not a violation of coma so if your board is using something to get on the same page so they can all actually have a meeting, that's probably okay. So long as it doesn't, you know, go sideways, off down the, the path of talking about stuff they're not supposed to. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the bed tax committee that reports back to the city council, are they under this? I would argue yes. They can argue no. They might be a subordinate group is what I'm getting at. So if they are not complying with COMA and you think they should be, Ask them. Ask them why they're not. I'm part of it. 
All right, a little harder, but you got to hold the camera, turn the camera on, point at yourself, ask yourself. Um, <laughs> no, that's not nice. If you have a question on, if you sit on something, you wonder where you belong. The city attorney um, would be a good person to have that discussion with. Because they can provide you specific legal advice related to your specific committee, and they're going to know a lot more details than I do. So that's who I would talk to if you have concerns on whether or not you should be or whether you need to be. So, if, yes. Okay, so we have our trustees who make it little committees like personnel mm -hmm. and budget. Sure. So, um, do we have to notify people that we're having a budget committee if we have less than four people? If they're and if they're not making any decisions, they're just looking at it, discussing it, deliberating, and then bringing it to the board. Do you have to so, let people know? Well, when we talked about the idea of subordinate groups, I want you to treat them as a separate entity. So it doesn't matter if they're just three out of your eight board of voting members. The subordinate group is its own entity. That doesn't mean that you qualify as a subordinate group because, like you said, your advisory only is an exception. It's just something to keep in mind. That doesn't mean that necessarily you are a subordinate group. Because you have final rulemaking authority, for instance, or are you just to report back to the name? So it, it's something that you're going to have to determine whether or not you are worried about. Um, and if you want to go ahead and post it, let people know. Well, at the end of the day, you're never ever going to get in trouble for treating your entity as subject to coma. You, you just won't. I wouldn't do it if I was a homeowners association. Why bring that pain upon yourself? <laughs> <laughs> So when you talk about different aspects, of it, you know, well, it's kind of hard to prove that I, uh, I sent her to this office. Mm -hmm. But then in today's world of security systems and cameras, in today's world, it may be a little easier. Um, and almost always, people are stupid enough to send an email first asking you to do something. So, here in the office, I have X I want to talk to you about. And then there's that security camera and then walking out of the office shaking your head. Yeah. So it is much easier to prove now than it used to be. It used to be a uh, she said, she said, who said, she said. I can't do all those words together. My answers are not great. I apologize. So meeting conduct. Coma doesn't talk about meeting procedures at all. Nowhere in Coma are you going to see you got to use Robert's rules of order. It just doesn't care. The only thing that Coma really cares about in terms of meeting conduct is your meeting open to the public free of charge. Other than that, you can conduct your meeting any way, in any process, in any timeline you want to. It does not care. Agenda. It's another area in which the coma doesn't require a whole lot. Under the Open Meetings Act, you're not even required to create an agenda. It does not. It doesn't require you to create one. All it says is if you are going to create one, you have to put everything you know that you want to talk about on the agenda at that time. There's also no prohibition in the Open Meetings Act from amending that agenda once you got to the meeting or at a later date. Once you have a rule that governs your group that says you have to do something differently. The Open Meetings Act is really lax here. It doesn't care that much. So, If you do create an agenda and you've had somebody just requested to receive that agenda, you do have to provide it to them before the meeting. Um, when we were doing everything virtually there for a while, you had to send it to them via email. In traditional, it just meant you had to put it by the door to the meeting room so they could get it on their way in. So whatever you choose to do above and beyond what the Open Meetings Act absolutely requires, I'm not going to frown on that. I think perhaps the support for the Open Meetings Act is a little low in some cases. So if your agenda is not required to be created, but you create one, mm -hmm. we have one at the bottom, like uh, old business and new business under other sellouts. And to add things to it if somebody has a question. There's no prohibition under the Open Meetings Act you don't have. Okay, so unless you have a rule that governs your specific group that says you can't do it, then the Open Meetings Act is not going to prohibit you. Anymore. My whole point there when it says everything you know that you want to talk about is they don't want you to have a shadow agenda, so to speak. So you have the one public agenda, but here's your actual agenda. That's going to raise an issue we dealt with as well. So as we're still talking a little bit about meeting conduct. Use of cameras, photographic lights, and recording devices by a member of the public to record an open meeting is perfectly allowable. It's perfectly okay. I got yelled at by a sheriff once about this. He said, I don't want them recording me. So, a member of the public is completely allowed to record any portion of an open meeting so long as they're not disruptive. Now, a governing body of a public entity does have the ability to set reasonable rules that would help ensure orderly conduct to make sure that people you know, don't disrupt the meeting. You can think of the various ways somebody can be disrupted in a meeting. 
like the idea of when it comes to recording, they have their phone out and they walk up to you whenever you're talking and hold it right in front of your face. Perhaps that's disruptive. I don't know. You guys can think of the things. We live in the world of wind parks. If you've ever been to a county commission meeting when they're talking about wind parks, I'm not taking a position one way or the other because I get a lot of calls about wind parks. So disruptive, I, I get how things can be disruptive. Also, a little bit of a misconception. There's no guaranteed public right to speak under the Open Meetings Act. It's simply not a statute. Anything that you folks do to allow a member of the public to speak, that's great. I, I believe it's probably a healthy thing. It is not absolutely required by the law. They only have the right under this set of statutes to listen and observe your meetings. There's no constitutional right to speak at a public meeting. I call the name about that one too. Location of the meeting. The Open Meetings Act doesn't care where you have your meeting so long as it's accessible to the public free of charge. You may have ADA compliance issues and other things, but that's outside of Coma. Coma only cares about it being open to the public free of charge. Coma absolutely specifically prohibits the idea of secret ballots. Point of voting under the Open Meetings Act is that every member of the public should be able to see how every member of a public body votes on every issue. So simply tallying up the votes, passing them down to the chair and saying this passes four to three is not sufficient to comply with the Open Meetings Act. Quite frankly, that would probably lead to a complaint in which your vote would be invalidated and you'd have to go home and do it again. Minutes, yet another area in which Tacoma doesn't set very high standards. Yes, sir. All right, back to the ballot. What about mail ballots? Which you still need to have your financial something like that approved. I would worry that that falls into the secret ballot category. Um, when in doubt, if you have the ability, you could designate somebody with the authority to sign on behalf of the whole. Um, but in terms of mailing your ballot for people who actually get to see each person cast their ballot, that's where you might run into this. What if you put them online? Let's say you scanned all the mail ballots and put them online. No. Okay. Would you save them for years? Now, the, the whole point, and, and why I keep saying no to all of this is, it, it really is a matter of the public actually physically being able to see that person vote. That that is the requirement at, at the bottom. The idea of the mail-in ballots and the idea of posting things online has been brought up before. It's been beaten down every time. So what are we doing with COVID and Zoom when people um, had a meeting and they voted from afar? Mm -hmm. Could, could I see him do it? Yeah, and so, yeah, so the, the, the video aspect of, the video aspects of Zoom have been enough to comply. What if I don't want to record the Zoom, but the secretary here mm -hmm. recorded who said what and did what? Well, yeah. The whole point is during the meeting, okay. you could see him do it. So it doesn't mean you gotta keep a copy of it. Okay. Um that's up to your retention schedule on how much you have to keep. Okay. Exactly. But no, Coma doesn't require you to keep a recording of anything for any amount of time. So that's going to be whatever your retention schedule, your local rules would require you to keep and for however long you'd have to keep it. Um, to that end, though, I will note that a few times in the last few years, the legislature tried to introduce a bill that would require all public bodies to record their meetings and post it immediately to their website in only 24 hours. I think. Um, did not contemplate how large these things are for storage, um, let alone how you can make those accessible to somebody with a visual handicap, right. um, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. So none of that stuff is contemplated in this very small two-page bill, which I take no opinion about, I promise. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's just something to keep in mind is that topic has been brought up before. So if it never becomes a reality, I do hope they'll provide some mechanism for funding at the very least to help folks be able to actually store this stuff, um, et cetera. Going on to the Zoom meeting. Yes. Um, more and more of those. So you're having your meeting, and say someone doesn't want to have their camera on, but they want to vote via the chat feature in Zoom or whatever. No. Okay. Because I mean, it could be anybody saying that you can't see that they're the ones doing it. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news here, but I don't want your votes to get invalidated. Okay. <laughs> one, one more question. Absolutely. So if you're holding a Zoom meeting mm -hmm. and they choose not to turn on their camera, mm -hmm. then you're going to have to do voice vote only? Yeah. Or phone in without one. Phone in has always been allowed. So the 
the same idea for Zoom here, where it's verbal only. Okay. I know it's a really it's weird fuzzy line. Good if they shut off the so, verbal is good because in theory you can identify that as a person who's speaking. Um, whereas no camera, no audio, I can be the one typing their answer. Right. So, like I say it's a really <laughs> weird and fuzzy line. I know. All right, minutes. Under the Open Meetings Act, public body is only required to record into their minutes those motions to go into executive session. It's the only thing you're required to keep and put in your minutes under the Open Meetings Act. You post two short minutes outside of that. That's great, but it's not requirement of coma. I told you it's such a really low bar. So I'm only going to just brush across KAR 16 20 1. This is Kansas Administrative Regulation 16 20 1. This is put in place by my agency right about the time the pandemic kicked in in March 20, I'm talking 2019 at this point. I lost track 2020. Years are blending together for me. I apologize. So the point of this was I told you that the Open Meetings Act was put in place back in the 70s. All the language, almost all the language of the Open Meetings Act is still native to the 1970s. Does it contemplate social media? It doesn't contemplate Zoom, you know, WebEx, those kinds of things. So my agency put in place this administrative regulation to show agencies how to comply with the Open Meetings Act when using online platforms to conduct their meetings, such as Zoom or WebEx, et cetera. It is only applicable during a period of emergency declaration. We are not currently under a period of emergency declaration, so therefore this regulation does not govern your public meetings. Just know that if at any point you are under an emergency declaration, failure to comply with this regulation can be deemed just as much trouble as failure to comply with statutes. If anybody wants to read it, and I don't highly recommend reading it unless you have to, you can find a copy of it on our website at ag.ks.gov. Um, it really lays out the simple things that we were hearing people messing up in March of that year. Like failure to identify yourself when you're on Zoom meeting because you can't actually read your name plate by the way you have your camera angled in the meeting room. Just small stuff. All right, executive sessions. Without a doubt, the biggest area of concern I hear from folks, they didn't do it right. They had this person in the room who shouldn't have been in the room. Or I swear they went out and they talked about this instead of this. Those kinds of things. So the point of executive session is to permit discussion of certain enumerated matters outside of public view. There are certain topics that do not need to be discussed in public. I want you to think of personnel matters. When you're talking about a specific employee's potential termination or discipline, those things are probably best done to help protect the privacy of that specific employee. So to conduct an executive session, an open meeting has to be convened first, and then you can recess into executive session. This position of the Attorney General's office if there's no mechanism in place to simply convene a closed or executive session meeting. You have to first convene an open meeting and recess into an executive session for a specific amount of time and then come back into open session before your meeting ends. And we'll go through that process. We also, as I said, there's no mechanism in place in the Open Meetings Act to extend an executive session without a formal motion. I hear this a lot. They just poke their head back in the room and said we need 10 more minutes. That's not appropriate. It's also not legal. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to phrase it, the whole point here of the executive session motion is to let members of the public know when and where you're going to resume your meeting. So they don't come back after you've already started, or they're not sitting there waiting on you to come back. So simply extending your meeting without that formal motion at the time you said you're going to come back in doesn't provide that proper notice to those individuals who are attending the meeting. In the executive session, no bindings, no binding action may be taken on any matter that requires an open vote. So I have to come back in the open meeting to conduct that vote. You're allowed to achieve a consensus, but if you do have that consensus achieved, you have to come back in the open session and go ahead and carry through with your formal vote. Attendees to executive session is a little complicated. Technically, under statute, only members of that public body have the right to attend an executive session. Your observers are not allowed to attend an executive, an executive session. Generally, staff members are not allowed to attend an executive session. Agents or other non-public body individuals don't have a specific right to attend an executive session. However, the public body does have the right to invite those individuals they believe will either aid in the discussion 
or provide information on a permissible topic or participate in the discussion. Just keep in mind the public body has to defend who they let in the room. Doesn't mean they can't, it just means they have to defend the decision to let certain people in the room. And for certain of the executive session justifications, who you let in the room might negate your executive session. So to go into executive session, there has to be a formal motion seconded and carried. And that complete motion as stated needs to be recorded in your minutes and retained permanently. And when I say as stated, I actually mean as stated. So if they screw it up when they say it, that's the motion you record. So what we recommend highly is that if you know there's gonna be an executive session, and we'll get into the justifications and exceptions. If you know there's gonna be an executive session, write out your motion, have somebody read it into your minutes. That way there's no doubt about what they asked or what they went to executive session for. Because I've talked to a lot of county clerks who are generally going to be the secretary of these county commission meetings. And without a doubt, I hear this, I know what they meant to say. It's not appropriate. You still have to enter in the executive session motion as stated. If it's not clear, you can't understand what it was. That's why we ask people to write out their motions first. That way it's clearer, cleaner, less potential issue later. That motion to go into executive session has to have these things. There has to be a statement of subjects to be discussed without revealing confidential information. There has to be justification, which you're going to find the list in statute 754319. You have to put the time and place in which the open meeting or was there. This is why you can't just extend or end early because you're telling people when we're going to be back. You have to have all of these things or it's not a proper motion for purposes of the Open Meetings Act. And at its worst, it risks invalidating anything that you've done after you get back from executive session. So until 2017, the statement of subjects to be discussed was the statutory requirement. You know, why would we want to make everything make sense? Um, statement of subjects to be discussed used to be the statutory requirement. Now it's not. Now it's the, the plus. So you have justification, which are the things found in the statute, and your statements of subjects to be discussed are your added information. So for instance, and we're going to talk about justifications here in just a second. If you're going out into executive session to talk about personal matters of non-elected personnel, which is one of your specific statutory justifications. What is your subject? It could be employee evaluations. It could be potential employee discipline. You don't have to say that Bob stole from the vending machines. We're talking about fire and Bob. You could. You don't have to give away specific identifying details. You just have to provide a little bit more than just employee uh, personal matters of non-elected personnel. You have to provide the topic, so to speak. So there are a list of justifications found at 754319. These are going to be the most commonly used ones. Personal matters, without a doubt, is one of the most common ones. Consultation with the public body's attorney is another one of the large ones. And we'll break these down just a little bit because so personal matters, non-elected personnel. And I told you the whole point here is to kind of protect the privacy interests of the employee because simply because you're going to review whether or not an employee has done something wrong doesn't mean that employee has done something wrong. And to out them in public beforehand, if I were that employee, I'm suing you. And I'm an attorney, I'm litigious. So, yeah. um, so this justification does not apply to independent contractors, board appointees, or committee appointees. This only applies to non-elected personnel. So the board members don't get this. If you have independent contractors that work for your entity, they don't get this. this Justification only applies to employees that are non-elected of your agency. In addition to the new wrinkle, you can discuss applicants for employment. So if you're doing employee interviews for potential open positions, this is where you can utilize this justification. Consultation with the public body's attorney. I'm going to say right now, simply having your attorney in the room doesn't mean you get to use this justification. You actually have to talk about a privileged communication. Actually has to be something related to that attorney's position with your board, not just having them in the room doesn't cover everything. It's not to talk about a letter the attorney has written the board. The attorney actually does need to be physically present as well for this. And I will say, if you have third parties in the room, you're breaking that privilege and thereby negating this executive session. Third parties for our purposes here do not include, let me rephrase that in a way that's not gonna be confusing. Employees of your agency are covered by this privilege as well. 
It is when it is somebody from outside of your agency comes in. It's when you're breaking this privilege. I don't want to understand that. All right. I don't get what you just said. Okay. So the attorney represents the board mm -hmm. of your agency. Yeah. You as an employee of that agency are covered by the privilege of that communication. Okay. So you being in the room doesn't break that privilege. But me, who doesn't work for your agency, if I am present in that room, that justification is now invalid because I break that privilege because I'm not covered under the attorney-client confidentiality provisions. I'm not covered under any of that. So when you have an outside entity present in your room for that justification, it is invalid. So an example would be you can have your attorney there with employees within your library, your board members, and a member of the press. If you have that member, member of the press, the press there, breaks that privilege. Yeah. So no third party is going to be present nope. at the executive session. Not for this justification. To apply. Um, the attorney client privilege is in Chapter 60, which is a rule of civil, civil procedure. It's above and outside the open meeting. That having a third party present breaks that privilege, which negates the whole purpose of this. What is that third party? Is the reason why the session? So that third party is in the meeting because of something that happened. Find another executive session. This will probably apply. So you don't talk your attorney with someone else. Well, because that other person's not bound by that confidentiality, right? right? right. So that's that third right. person can walk out and just air all of that laundry. Right. I get it. Sorry, I didn't say that very artfully. I apologize. No, it's fine. I'm just trying to figure out why. Well, I'll give you the question. What if the attorney is not actually present? They're phoning the attorney. Does that still count? So when we talk about meetings and it doesn't matter how you gather, the same goes for executive sessions. So, I mean, you can still have a phone executive session. So, because we see that a lot in our small communities where the attorney's not mm -hmm. physically made, you know, that many trips around mm -hmm. the day. Right. <laughs> I talked to a lot of attorneys that represent multiple small cities, counties, agencies. And as long as they're present, and by present, I mean they're, that, that phone equals that as well. Okay. One thing I need to do mention, uh, need to mention. It is our position that I, went, I showed you the motion to go into executive session. And you have to have all three of these things to go into that motion of executive session. It is also our position that you can only have one justification for executive session. You can have multiple subjects related to that one justification, but only one justification for executive session, if that makes sense. So say you're going to talk about personal matters, not elected personnel, but you might also want to talk about it consultation with your public body's attorney. So it can't be in the same executive session. However, if you want to talk about personal matters and non-elected personnel, you want to talk about employee evaluation for this employee. You want to talk about employee discipline for this employee, et cetera, et cetera. All those subjects that are all related to that one justification, you can do in that one executive session. There's no prohibition on having multiple executive sessions in your meeting. So if you have multiple different topics, justifications that you want to talk about, you certainly can. You just need to do them in separate executive sessions. Employer and employee negotiations. And I leave this one in here because people get this one wrong a lot. This is meant for formal labor negotiations only. Formal labor negotiations only. This isn't just when an employer wants to address their employees or the employees want to just address the employer. These are formal labor negotiations if your entity has relations with um, organized labor entities. For instance, I used to do this in another life. I would go and do these kinds of negotiations, and those were all subject to this form of executive session. You didn't have to be open to the public. Um, school boards do have different rules. They operate under the Professional Negotiations Act, I think, the PNA. So all of their labor negotiations open, um, whereas most other agencies don't have to do those in open session. They relating to the financial affairs of trade secrets or corporations, trusts, um, partnerships, or proprietorships. This is the economic development exception. So if your entity is negotiating with a company, um, potential for a contract, for instance, and that company has trade secrets or certain financial information that they want to hold secret, this is a potential justification that can be used to have that meeting not in open with them. I would caution this one a little bit because there's absolutely no case law on this one. So how far a court would let you go is anybody's guess. Matters affecting a student, patient, or resident of a public institution. 
So resident of a public institution for our purposes here equals inmate in one of the prisons, um, inmate in a county jail, um, resident of one of the state mental institutions. So this justification is a little bit different because any hearings that are held but using this justification do have to be open if the person that's subject to the hearing requests that it be open to the public. Going back on that. Yeah. I think all of us have the idea of discussing a problem patron. Now, problem patron is probably not going to apply for this one. Because they're not a student, they're not a patient, they're not a resident of a public institution. It has to be one of those specific in, uh, people for this one to apply. Are there exceptions to that? As in? You, you have a sexual harassment issue in your library with a student and another student? So sexual that would fall under Title IX. Sexual harassment and Title IX is going to this. Um, Title IX has its, own, has its own process. Yes. An important process, don't get me wrong. It's its own process above and outside of the Open Meetings Act. So that's its own. Okay. So, so, yes, I guess there are exceptions in which something else might override or apply in more force. So, okay. as you said, I don't know. But back to my original question mm -hmm. many of our library boards will want to discuss something about a patron yes. that is causing issues. Is it possible to go into executive session on that, or is that wrong? Or what kind of guidance can you give us? Well, this justification, the one that we were talking about, the resident of the public institution, is probably not going to apply there because I don't think you can make right. that equal a patron. Um, if there are potential legal legal implications of this patron, um, by from your term, perhaps could apply here. Um, the justifications are narrow for a specific reason, and there isn't one that covers every topic. Right. So I don't know that there's going to be one that's 100 percent on point for what you're wanting there, but it certainly has some potential legal implications that might apply. So if you ask the advice of your attorney, for instance, or sorry, I wish I could give you one. No, yes. that's fine. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you yes, number nine applies. But it's... I'm just thinking that's something we deal with from time to time. Maybe you're the only one. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on what it is, your attorney, you may need to have a attorney client privilege for that. You might certainly need to, um, especially if it's somebody you're thinking about maybe not allowing back into your facility, for instance. Mm -hmm. Or not using your name in the judgment. Right. So, I mean, there are various ways that you can talk about it, but that just, forget that. The justification list is very limited for a specific reason. Since I told you at the very beginning of all this coma, that the whole point is to be very open to the public as much as humanly possible. And you do is very narrow in circumstances. So they don't allow a whole lot of potentially broad ranging justifications to go into executive session because they don't want you to conduct your whole meeting in session, say in the executive session. That's kind of the whole the whole point here. I know there are certain topics that you probably don't want to talk about openly in that meeting. There may be other ways to do it. But I don't know that one of these justifications is 100 percent going to help you get there. Gotcha. So that preliminary discussions of, re, of relating to the acquisition of real property is just to show you how narrow some of these are. This is preliminary discussions only and only related to the acquisition of real property. This doesn't talk about sale. This doesn't talk about your final discussions or negotiations. It's limited to exactly what it says. When I tell you some of these are incredibly narrow, this one is a good example of why some of these are incredibly narrow. Sometimes frustratingly so. And one that has become increasingly important yeah. is security measures, in which open discussion potentially jeopardizes security measures that protect infrastructure of your facility, the public, etc. I want you to think of intelligence information, tactical plans, resource deployment. If you have a continuity of operations plan that you want your board to discuss, what happens if there is a big emergency and you have to shut down or you have to move, etc. Those kinds of things relating to the Security of your facility can certainly be used under this justification and discussed under this justification. All right, that's coma very fast. Does anybody want to take a break for a second? Because I'm going to bore the heck out of you with the next bit. <laughs> <laughs> so we're right about three o'clock. If I can get you all back by about 310 at the latest. Thank <laughs> you. 
Act. So, kind of the same deal here. When we talk about the Open Records Act, all governmental agencies are subject to the Open Records Act and they're generally going to be subject to the Open Meetings Act. So, when people call me about CORA, which people do tend to call me about CORA, you're going to see a list here of things that we usually talk about. So, this is the idea of reasonable fees, actual costs. Anytime that people have to pay money in exchange for records or information, there's potential for conflict if they don't get what they wanted or what they thought they wanted. So, the records provided didn't meet the requester's expectations. This is really going to be a communication issue. They didn't ask for something in a way that you could understand what they actually wanted, or they asked for something other than what they really wanted. The requester believes there should be existing public records, but there's simply none that exists. Sometimes somebody believes you create a record that is just not something that you normally create or have to create. Is an agency or entity even covered by the CORA? And if not, why are they not covered by the CORA? Simple stuff like failure to respond within three business days, failure to provide access to the records as requested, access to criminal investigation records, or applications of exemptions or exceptions to disclosure. Now, there are mandatory exemptions to disclosure that are going to be found in statutes, either federal or state, that require certain documents to be held confidential. There are also discretionary closures, which you're going to find under the Open Meetings Act. There are well over 50 of these. I'm not going to cover all of them, I assure you, because you don't want to know all 50, some of them. The whole point of CORA is that public records shall be open for inspection by any person unless otherwise provided. This act is going to be liberally construed towards openness. Anything you as a governmental entity does that restricts somebody's access to records or access to portions of records needs to be very narrowly tailored to a statutorily allowed purpose. It's going to sound real familiar. It's going to be kind of the same general idea as coma. Anything you do that limits people's access to records, you guys have to defend completely. Public agency has to be able to show statutorily why they did not provide access to something. Or in reality, that you didn't have a record. That's why we didn't provide access. You have to defend your actions here. Now, the CORA was enacted in 1984. It replaced the Public Records Inspection Act of 1957. Now, the CORA, when it came in place in the 80s, greatly expanded. That 1957 act only required governmental agencies to provide access to or copies of those records they were statutorily required to create in the first place. It's a very narrow window of records. Now the CORA makes basically all public records subject to that inspection or copying. So I want you to keep in mind the CORA was put in place in the 1980s. A lot of the language is going to be native to the 1980s. It doesn't contemplate cloud storage, it doesn't contemplate text messages or email or social media posts. Those things are all potentially records. Those things all potentially hold records. Simply because it's not talked about specifically in this 1980s language of the core doesn't mean it doesn't apply. All those things are still potentially subject to an open records request. What about security cameras? Absolutely. Still potentially subject to an open records request. So what the core does, it provides a process in which the public can view or make copies of those records. Kind of this is going to look pretty similar to the coma. When we talk about public agency, we're talking about the state. We're talking about any political or taxing subdivision of the state or any office agency or instrumentality thereof. So instead of subordinate groups for the purposes of the Open Records Act, we have this idea of instrumentality. We're going to kind of look at that same test. 
how is this instrumentality created? How is it funded? How does it function? Does it act on behalf of a government agency? Does it do something that would be considered a traditional government function? This is also not spelled out in statute, but we do have a little case law, fairly recent with the Kansas Supreme Court that tells you a little bit about instrumentality. Great Plains of Kiowa County, Inc. was a hospital group in Kiowa County. It was a private for-profit company. It was hired by the county hospital board to run the county hospital. Subsequently, the county hospital board requested records from this private hospital that was running the county hospital. So this private hospital company denied access to those records on the grounds that it was a private company. And it is a private for-profit company. Supreme Court in 2018 ruled that Great Plains of Kyle County Inc. was determined to be an instrumentality for purposes of the Open Records Act. Its records were open to the public. They were public records. <coughs> because it acted as an instrumentality, it did something that was a traditional government function, which is one of the factors that lead into something being an instrumentality. So while that was a private company, it's public records related to that hospital were exactly that, public records. So this is a reference to that case, if anybody wants to look it up. Certain things are generally not gonna be public agencies for our purposes. So generally private companies, even if they receive public funds in exchange for goods or services. So I want you to think of all the entities that your agency may have contracts with. They're not generally going to be public agencies for purposes of the quorum. In addition, in addition, initiable state judges or justices are not subject to the quorum as public agencies. Now, the entities they work for, the judiciary is subject to the quorum, but individual judges are not. So what is a public record? I want you to think of this as broadly as humanly possible. It's any recorded information, regardless of form, characteristics, or location, which is made, maintained, or kept by or is in the possession of either a public agency or an officer of an, or an employee of a public agency pursuant to their official duties. A couple things to break out. This statute was amended a few years ago to add the idea of location. It does not matter where you keep a record. You can do let me put it this way. A public record can be on your private device, be on your private email, be on your private social media. If it is for your work-related purposes, if it's related to the business or affairs of your agency, it's potentially a public record no matter where you store it. So you can't use personal email to get around having a public record in public, so to speak. Also, this says made, maintained, or kept buyers in possession of. This doesn't have to be a record that your agency even creates. This has to be a record that your agency possesses or maintains. All of these things make something a public record that your agency potentially possesses pursuant to the Open Records Act. So this includes all written records, photographs, computer data, email, et cetera. Like I said, as broad as humanly possible. Public record doesn't include records that are owned by a private person or entity and not related to the functions, activities, programs, or operations funded by public funds. So for our purposes here, private person is never going to include an officer or employee of a public agency when they're acting pursuant to their official duties, whether they're on the clock or off the clock, it does not matter. If you're doing something related to work, what you're creating is a public record. In addition, records that are made, maintained, or kept by an individual who is a member of the, either the legislature or the governing body of any political or taxing subdivision of the state are not considered to be public records. The entities they serve have public records. The legislature has public records, but each individual legislator does not have records that are subject to the Open Records Act if they are the only one that possesses them. It's a bit of a weird line to draw, but something that's fairly important for me as I work as an open records officer as part of my gig, um, records that are not in existence at the time of the request are not considered public records. There's no requirement under the Open Records Act that you, as an agency, create records in order to fulfill a records request. This has to be records that are in existence when that request is made of you. So future requests or rolling requests don't have to be honored. They can be denied as records that are not in existence. So, CORA is incredibly procedural. 
It tells people how they can make a request. It tells you as an agency when you need to respond, what you can redact or exempt from disclosure, to some extent what you can charge for those records. So what does a public agency absolutely need to do? Okay, a public agency has to appoint a Freedom of Information or Open Records Officer to help assist with core requests. I currently hold that role with the Attorney General's Office. You have to display, distribute, or otherwise make available a brochure describing requester rights, public agency responsibilities, and procedures for inspecting or obtaining copies of public records. Keep in mind it's a 1980s language. The brochure doesn't need to necessarily be a paper brochure. It can be a policy on your website. It can be something that you print off for folks if they want it. That brochure policy has to include the name, the title of the records custodian, your fee structure, and your office hour, hours that are available for people to come and make records requests. The Attorney General's Office, we have a form on our website along with our policy that if anybody wants to see how we've outlined hours, you can certainly take a look at. So in Kansas, who can make a records request? Yes, there's any person may make a records request. They must be a citizen of the state of Kansas. They don't have to be a resident of the state of Kansas. They don't have to be a resident of the United States. Any person anywhere can make a records request in Kansas. Now, other states have limited records requests to citizens of their states, and it's been upheld as far as the Supreme Court level. You'll see an example of the state of Virginia that limited records request to citizens of the Commonwealth only. But in Kansas, any person anywhere can make a records request. They get a number of correspondence from England for some reason which is perfectly fine. They never ever give me money. They never ever get records. <laughs> All right, important to this is a person doesn't need to provide you a reason why they're making a records request. And you're not allowed to say, why do you want this record? You can certainly ask for clarification if what they've asked for is not clear, but you're not allowed to demand why they want a copy of a record and they don't have to tell you. Somewhere along the line, they thought that public agencies were trying to pressure people into not asking for records, so they don't want you to ask questions about why somebody wants something. Mm -hmm. You are, as a public agency, allowed to require that a request you receive be made in writing. Um, I highly recommend this. It kind of eliminates the miscommunication aspect of verbal requests. You are allowed to request or require that requester's name and address be provided. My agency does not allow anonymous requests um, for one specific reason. We get a lot of very voluminous requests. And if we've spent a lot of time working on it, anonymous people are not going to pay that fee. Almost never. You can also ask for proof of identification. Some records might be particular to a specific individual and released to anybody else might be a problem. Um, for our agency, I would say records related to concealed carry, among other things. <coughs> You can ask for a written certification that a requester is not going to use any list of names and addresses that they obtain from records in order to solicit sales and services from the people named in those records. Um, you as a public agency, once you've requested they provide that certification, if they, prior, if they sign that certification, you're exempted from anything they do with that list afterwards. So say somebody gets them a list of names and addresses from you and then goes around and goes ahead and does that solicitation of sales and services, you're exempted from liability. Is how I would phrase that simply because they signed that certification, so you had to take them good faith to find out what they said. The right of, oh, I said sustaining to get them in trouble would be by the people named on that list. So, rights of request are under Kansas law are very great. The public has a right to review all public records. Any person gets to make any abstracts or request copies of all public records. Now, if you as a public agency have records, that you can't make copies of in your location. I'm starting to see this a lot with microfilm and microfish, where an agency might still have microfilm or microfish, but no longer has a, a microfilm or microfish reader that actually works. Mm -hmm. It's getting more and more common, having translated it over onto digital media, et cetera. I, there, there are cabinets all over the state, I know. If you, if you as an agency have those records, but you can't make those copies, you have to allow that requester at that requester's expense to make arrangements to get those records copied. So if you have microfilm, you don't have the ability to make those copies. You have to allow them to make those copies so that you can kind of control how it happens. Also, the portions of record are closed. The remainder of that record must be made available to the requester. So if you have a social security number on this page, that doesn't mean you can't give them that record. It means you redact that social security number and provide the remainder of that record to them. 
Now, there are some limitations on requesters' rights. Generally, a requester is not allowed to remove a public record from your premises without the written consent of the records custodian. All records custodians not only have the duty to help members of the public access or obtain copies of public records, but they also have to protect those public records from damage to the organization and loss. So any records custodians in the room, you're the ones that get held liable if those records get lost or destroyed. Now, you as a public agency are generally not going to be required to make copies of radio or recording tapes or discs, videotapes or films, pictures, slides, graphics, or illustrations unless they're shown at a public meeting. Now, there are some exceptions to that related to some criminal investigation matters. Um, court subpoenas certainly accept them. But generally, you're not required to provide those copies. But I mean, you can't, it just means you're not required to. Also, copyrighted materials may not be reproduced without the express written permission of the copyright holder. You possess copyright and shows you don't have to make somebody a copy of that. Somebody think of the kind of record it could be. We have a number of copyrighted publications in our office that we're not going to make copies of the post. <clears throat> so the nuts and bolts of Cora. Any request received has to be acted upon as soon as possible, no later than the end of the third business day following the date the records request is received. By the end of that third business day, there are three acceptable responses and you can provide to that person. I mean, you can't provide it on day one or day two, but by the end of that third business day, at the latest, you have to provide that person one of these three answers. You have to tell them the record is provided. You have to provide it in the form requested if it is possible to do so. I like this one because then I can close out the request. Somebody gets the record they want. Everybody's moderately happy for the moment. Anyway. Unfortunately, the world I live in, I end up doing step number two the most often. This is where you tell the requester that the request is under review and the records if permitted will follow. This is where you can ask for clarification if the request you receive is not clear. I asked for a lot of clarification because I received a whole lot of requests in which somebody knew what they wanted but did not have the ability to tell me what they wanted. This is where you can ask for prepayment of fees, which is allowed under the Open Records Act. My agency requires prepayment of fees. As I said, we have a number of voluminous requests. So before we do a work that's going to cost us 40 hours of time, we ask for prepayment of fees to cover those costs. This is where if you have records that are in off-site storage, you can tell them it's going to take us four days, five days, two weeks to gain access to these records. For the first aid agency, this is when we used to tell folks, I'm sorry, those records are in the salt mine, it's going to take us two weeks to go. So that intermediate step is somewhere in between, where there's some other step that you need, some help you need from them, et cetera, that makes it so you can't provide immediate access to those records. The third response is that the request is denied. Now, the Open Records Act states that if a requester specifically asks you, you have to tell them why you're denying the records request. Outside of that, you don't have to tell them. So if they haven't said, please tell me why you're going to deny my request, when they make their request, you don't have to tell them why you're denying their request. That's a little ridiculous. So whenever I deny a records request, I specifically tell them statutory provision if there's a statutory provision that applies as to why I'm not providing them access to their records. To be honest, the most off, the, the most common reason why I deny a records request is because I asked the wrong agency. It's not something I have. You as a records custodian have to, if you do know, try to point them in the right direction of who they should go to. If I get a request and I think it belongs to say the Department of Labor, I try to give them directions on how to make a request to the Department of Labor. I have some idea of who they should actually ask instead of telling them no, you can't have it. But sometimes you get a request, you don't know what they want, you don't have it, you have no idea who does. That's an honest answer to. I know the calendar is going to look a little simplistic, but I want to tell you about business days and business hours because you have no idea how many times I get self reporting people who misread an AM versus a PM on an email. So business days for our purposes are Monday through Friday. Business hours for the purposes of the Open Records Act are generally going to be 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So any request that you receive after 5 p.m. on any given day is not for the purposes of the Open Records Act being received until the following day. For instance, if you get a records request on Monday, November the 1st, which, sorry, I duplicated my number, Monday, to November, November the 1st at 6.55 p.m., it's not being received until Tuesday, November the 2nd. That means your calendar doesn't start. So three, four, you owe an answer out by the end of the day. We don't count holidays, we don't count weekends, and we don't count inclement weather days. 
I don't know if there's any such thing as inclement weather days anymore for it to work. But. So I do have to mention penalties again. Now these are going to look very similar to what they did for, for, for Coma, with one exception. That $500 civil penalty is paid by the agency. It's not paid by the individual member of your governing body. It's paid by your agency as a whole. In addition, the required completion of attorney general approved training can be aimed at any specific employee who is responsible for open records work in your agency. Other than that, it's the same orders to cease and desist from further violations. You can be ordered to comply with the Open Records Act, and you can pay those reasonable expenses, investigation costs, and attorney's fees. Now, allowable fees and charges. We actually get much less formal complaints about allowable fees and charges than you might think, but these are the ones you read about in the paper. Public agency is only allowed to recover their actual costs necessary to provide access to requested records. Actual cost only, not cost you're going to incur otherwise. It's not meant to pay your rent. It's not meant to pay your overhead. It's not meant to pay your utilities. It's not meant to pay overtime status for the one employee you've decided to assign to fulfill records requests so you can pass on their overtime to the requester. Sorry, I had that question once. What about the only way you can get them to do the work? Outside of regular hours, or I wouldn't, I wouldn't pass that cost on to your pleasure. You're going to lose work. Okay. Now, those costs can include your staff time necessary to retrieve, review, redact information, make copies, mail, etc. Anything it actually takes to fulfill that records request are things that you can charge for. So you do have to make sure that your fees you charge are reasonable and never to exceed your actual. I mean, are act are your actual costs that they should not be unreasonable in addition. So if your actual costs are really, really high, just think about whether or not somebody is going to sue you anyway. Um, say, for instance, you have outside counsel that you have to, have to review stuff and they charge you $600 an hour. If you pass $600 an hour onto that requester, is that going to end up in your local newspaper or you end up getting sued? So I'm saying you have to comply with the law, but sometimes you also have to look at the optics of what you're going to charge. I have a couple requests open right now. If I charge what it's actually going to take us, I could be driving a brand new car here. But we're not going to charge that much. As I said, your fees can be estimated and collected before the records are provided. Now, if you were an executive branch agency, you have another step that you would have to do under Executive Order 18-05. Up to the first 100 pages of copying has to be provided for free if you are an executive branch agency under the office of the governor. So, as nobody here is, including me, I'm or for an independently elected constitutional official, so I don't have to worry about that. So when we talk about CORA, there's a general presumption of openness. In general, all records are open unless otherwise provided in statute or law. All requested re public records must be released unless there's a specific statutory exemption to disclosure. That burden is going to rest entirely on you as a public agency to prove that there is an exemption to disclosure. And there are two large categories of exemptions to disclosure. One is discretionary or policy reasons why there may be a reason to not provide a record. These are going to be found in the Open Records Act itself. We'll cover these quickly because I don't want to make you all fall asleep. And there are mandatory closure. This is where there's another federal statute, another state law, et cetera, that requires something to be held confidential. So when we talk about those mandatory closures, which we're going to talk about first, use a records custodian. It's not just a matter of being familiar with the Open Records Act. You have to be familiar with the statutes that cover the type of records you possess. So if you possess records that are subject to a federal restriction on provision to the public, then that federal law is going to trump the Open Records Act. The CORA will subordinate itself to another more specific federal or state law. And I'm not going to bore you all by talking too much about arrest warrants. I just want you to be aware, here is an example of another state law that overrides the Open Records Act. Now, arrest warrants were done in a couple different batches. Before 2014, the only people that had access to the affidavit sworn testimony that got people arrest warrants were the defendant or the defendant's counsel. After 2014, they added a provision that allowed any member of the public to make a request for those records. So it's a public record your agency could possess. So is it subject to the CORA? This is an area in which there's another specific statute this case, KSA 22-2302, that governs and not the CORA. 
under this process, the only way for a citizen to gain access to those records is to go through court. So a public agency, such as my own, who has these kind of records, even if you possess those records, are not allowed to provide them because there's a specific statute outside of the Open Records Act that tells you exactly how you can gain access to those records. So simply because it's something my agency might possess, the court does not control. So if you all really want to go over search and rest once we will, but the, the general gist is a member of the public can request access and all reviewed by a court for a number of factors to determine whether or not those records should be released, redacted, or not disclosed at all. So still talking about mandatory closure. These are other statutes that are going to override. So mentally ill person's commitment, treatment records, or privilege and shall not be disclosed pursuant to statute. Any release, even if I'm trying to use the CORA, is subject to a class C misdemeanor. I'm the one that's subject to that misdemeanor. Infectious or contagious disease reports. This one used to be a slide they didn't use very often until the last couple of years. So everybody's seen the stuff that's on news about COVID. That's this. So these reports can be disclosed as long as there's no identifiable information and disclosures for statistical purposes only. Or if identifiable person's consent writing, if it's necessary to protect the public health, or if there's a medical emergency and disclosures to qualify medical personnel, or if it's to the court in a child abuse matter and it's done in camera or in chambers. So never talked about infectious or contagious disease reports with anybody before the last couple of years. But the reason why these are on the news now is because there is a specific statutory provision that allows them to be disseminated. So still talking a little bit about mandatory closure. Juror lists. Now, listed prospective jurors are filed with the clerk of the court and are generally going to be public record. Now, this list used to statutorily state that they also had to have the address. <laughs> so that'd be the name of the prospective juror and their address. That's no longer the case. No, those addresses are no longer required to be made public. They're specifically exempted. So these are statutes that override the Open Records Act. Kind of the same idea with motor vehicle records. So generally, all motor vehicle records are subject to the Open Records Act except there's a federal law, the Driver's Privacy Protection Act, that specifically prohibits the dissemination of driver's license photos. So any agency that possesses driver's license photos or driver's license, you have to redact that photograph pursuant to federal law, even if it's a record that you otherwise possess and can provide under the Open Records Act. One point electric. If you possess any records that have social security numbers as a general practice, Redact the entire social security number every time. Don't leave any portion of it. You guys know this, right? Yeah. But we do get complaints from folks where actually we got complaints from somebody who received a copy, a group of records from the county clerk. And once they started going through the records, they found an entire page of social security numbers and redacted. Names, contact information, etc. Here's the bad thing. They wanted to file an open records complaint with us. That's not an open records violation. There's a whole lot of other things that are wrong with that. That's not an open records violation because they got the records they requested. They got more than they probably should have. So it's not a core complaint. It is an unauthorized disclosure pursuant to KSA 753520. Now, under that, if an entity accidentally releases any number of social security numbers, identifying information related to social security numbers, use public agency, you have to notify the individuals who are named as quickly as humanly possible the most expedient way that possible. You also have to offer them a year of free credit monitoring at your cost method. In addition, there is a $1,000 per violation penalty that your agency could be required to pay. So release of social security numbers gets really expensive really fast. And I'm not accusing anybody here of doing it. So why didn't the uh, unemployment administration have to do that for all of the Kansas information things that got stolen? Federal agency. Whether I agree with that or not. No, I, 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 I assure you, you're not the only one. But because you're a federal agency, they're not subject to our statute. <coughs> so there are a number of other mandatory closures under state law, federal law. We're not going to go over every, <coughs> Similarly, I'm not going to go over every single discretionary closure. I think there are 55, 56 of those. Most of those are not going to apply to everybody. There are three big categories of discretionary closure. 
that all of the things in Quora are going to fall under. One is going to be personal privacy protection. Another is going to be safety and security. And the third are going to be internal communication. So all of the discretionary closures under the Open Records Act fall into one of these categories. So things that are covered by personal privacy include medical, psychiatric, drug or alcoholism, drug dependency treatment records, pertaining to identifiable patients. So it can be discretionarily closed under the Open Records Act. A big one for well, state agencies, and I've, I've had to deal with this one for years, are personnel records, performance ratings, or other individually identifiable records pertaining to employees can be discretionarily closed, except for the specific categories of records that you see here. You have to, as a public agency, provide the names of employees, positions and titles of employees, salaries or actual employment contracts, including employment-related contracts or agreements of all your employees, including links of service. So I worked for the Department of Administration once upon a time, and one of the functions of that agency is they served as the state HR. So we would get yearly requests from entities for this for every state employee. So these are the things that you have to provide. My predecessor in this role used to call it the name, rank, and serial number of your employees. <laughs> so one thing to remember as a public employee, you have no expectation of privacy in what you make. You just don't, which seems to go against everything we feel that you as a public employee don't have an expectation of privacy in your salary. So there's a state website, as a matter of fact, called Candy, where you can look at pretty much every state employee's compensation. So as we talk about discretionary closure and personal privacy, this is a potentially really broad exception. This is the clearly unwarranted invasion of personal <coughs> privacy exception found at PSA 45-221-A30. So I want you to think if disclosure would be highly, uh, highly offensive to a reasonable person. So I want you to think of all the security answers to any website that you may have a password to, like your mother's maiden name. Um, you can also use this for your personal street address, your dates of birth, your personal phone number. I would say that this would apply to your personal email address. There could be a number of other things that might apply to it. There is no complete list. So it's that highly offensive to a reasonable person test, which attorneys love that because it's so open-ended. Um, so this one is potentially very broad. When I use this one, we have a number of consumer complaints. By a number, I'm, I'm, I'm way, way shooting that low. We have thousands of consumer complaints every year. If we get requests for consumer complaints, we never provide the consumer complaint name, their personal address, their mailing address or email address or phone number, any of that personally identifiable information that we think would be highly offensive to release. So those are things that we would redact out of those. There are quite a few protections under Kansas law for anybody who has a concealed carry license. So under the Open Records Act, just records that would disclose a name, home address, email address, phone, cell phone number, or other contact information for concealed carry licensees, applicants or persons who are enrolled or have completed weapons training. Those are discretionarily closed under the Open Records Act. I will go you one farther. KSA 75, 7C06, which is part of the Personal and Family Protection Act, specifically prohibits that release. So frankly, this should probably be in the mandatory category and not under the discretionary. I will note, under Kansas law, records of persons whose license has been suspended or revoked are subject to public inspection. So as long as you behave, nobody gets to know if you even have a license. If you have misbehaved, everybody gets to know that you had a license and what you did wrong. So these are ones I found, and this is the only group I'm going to show it to. So library, archive, and museum materials contributed by private persons to the extent of any limitations imposed as conditions of that contribution can be discretionarily closed or withheld from the public. In addition, library of patron and circulation records that pertain to identifiable individuals can be discretionarily closed. So you guys don't have to give out lists to your patients. You don't. So you were the one entity, the one group of folks that I'm actually talking about these specific slides with, because these are very specific to the work that you guys do. So you do have great discretion to not provide these things to the members of the public. <clears throat> so the next big category is going to fall into this idea of safety and security. Um, 
some of these aren't going to apply to you guys. Um, but I just want to make sure that you get some idea of what we're talking about. So records that will reveal identity of an undercover agent or any informant reporting a specific violation of law can be destruction when they close. Now, they made some changes to the Open Records Act in the last legislative session that impacted KSA 45221A12 specifically. So records concerning emergency or security informational procedures of a public agency, if that disclosure would jeopardize both public safety and also includes records of cybersecurity plans, cybersecurity assessments, what's the last one, cybersecurity vulnerabilities, so I don't have them quite memorized yet. So these are changes they made. We've also added the definitions for those three terms into the definition section of the Open Records Act as well. So that's also going to include plans, drawings, specifications, or related information, or any building or facility that is used for purposes requiring security measures in or around the building, or facility <laughs> that is used for the generation or transmission of power, water, fuels, communications. So this is a really poorly done exception it doesn't read well at all it reads worse down than it used to and it used to read very very poorly so the general gist here security measures of any kind potentially fall under this cybersecurity assessment vulnerabilities etc so this isn't just physical building security anymore it's also facility of your system uh, not facility, security of your system but don't get me to try to diagram this sentence um <laughs> Because that is truly all one sentence. Both of these slides together are now one sentence. So another area that they changed in the last session is related to law enforcement officers, um, certain attorneys and judges. So any of these listed people here, I fall into one of these categories. And requests from the entity in your county that maintains public addresses for folks, they like your county appraiser's office, for instance, might have the ability to search your name and find out where you live. Um, they do in Shawnee County, I know. So all of these listed folks can make a request with that entity that maintains that website to have their personally identifiable information stricken from that website. That entity has 10 business days to comply with that request. It's good for five years. It can be renewed on a rolling basis. Now, a number of the folks that I work with um, deal with some pretty unpleasant individuals. So they've taken advantage of these statutes to help protect where they live, protect their family. Also, the home address of any registered voter may be concealed from public inspection on a voter registration list or original voter registration application. They do have to make that request in writing to the county election officer. I'm going to note, Portions of this statute have been deemed unconstitutional, but not the portions I'm talking to you about. This was the statute that required certain proof of resident status. Those terms of things. So, just criminal investigations, really quickly, because I have to. Um, Criminal investigations also are audio, video recordings made or maintained by police, video, or vehicle cameras, in addition to being investigatory records. So all of these kinds of things are potentially criminal investigation records for our purposes. My agency deals with these quite a bit. I'm hoping you guys don't have to. Hmm. But kind of the, the hotter topic are these audio or video recordings made by body or vehicle cameras. You know, there are specific categories of folks under law that are allowed to listen or view those records. Those include the subject of the recording, the parent or the legal guardian of any subject who is under 18 years of age, the heir at law of a decedent who is subject of the recording, and an attorney for the subject of the recording or the parent or legal guardian or the heir at law. All of those people specifically have a right to view those records. And a police department or a sheriff's department or a criminal justice agency has to provide access to those records, but they do get to charge a reasonable fee to provide access to those records. Now, those are the only categories of folks that have a specific statutory right to view those records. That being said, there's been one court in the state of Kansas, I don't believe it's been appealed yet, who has added members of the media to this list, and I don't understand. I'm just letting you know they've been added to the list by one court that is not binding on anybody else until it's been raised up the chain. 
So quite a few things are not determined to be criminal investigation records. So I want you to think of all court records. Court records are not criminal investigation records. Anything that's been filed in the court is, frankly, you can go to the courthouse and get it. You can make a records request and receive it. So internal communications is that last big category of discretionary disclosure of records. So records that are privileged under the rules of evidence unless there's consent. So this is an area in which the attorney-client communications, for instance. So letters from your attorney. However, you as the holder of that privilege can waive it. So the attorney doesn't have a say. So if your agency wants to provide that record, you can without getting permission from your attorney. Records of an investigation conducted under civil litigation or administrative adjudication if that disclosure interferes with that procedure. So civil service board hearings, um, any of the types of investigations my agency does related to open government, um, any of our consumer investigations fall into this category. Correspondence between a public agency and a private individual, unless that correspondence is intended to give notice of a public agency action. So I want you to think of it this way. So if an individual sends your agency a letter, you don't necessarily have to provide that out there. If you've sent an individual letter, you may not necessarily have to provide that out unless it is to provide notification of a public agency action. Um, best example of that I can give you is a phone call I received from somebody who was livid that their city sent a list of all the posts they'd sent out the Moe Year Yard at all sliders to the public newspaper and that got posted in that newspaper. That's a public agency action, official action, which if you don't mow your yard, we're going to mow it and charge you for it. Um, and subsequently got put in the city newspaper. So the biggest one that falls under this internal communications exception to disclosure is notes, preliminary drafts, research data in the process of analysis, unfunded grant proposals, memoranda, recommendations, or other records which opinions are expressed or policies or actions are proposed. I want you to note the except. Except where such records are publicly cited or identified in an open meeting or in an agenda of an open meeting. This is an area in which the open meeting is actually override CORA. So even though you may have this exception to lean on, if you talk about these records, shown these records, discuss these records in an open meeting, they're now open. This exception will no longer apply. So the coma, where it interacts with CORA, generally is going to override the Open Records Act. Also, attorney work product can fall under the internal communications exception. There are a whole list of things related to public agency bids, but the general idea here are feasibility estimates, specs for competitive bidding don't have to be released to the public until they're approved by the public agency. All sealed <laughs> bids and related documents don't have to be released to the public until either one bid is accepted or multiple bids are accepted or all bids are rejected. So until the bid process is complete, public agency doesn't have to release those records to the public. And the reason for that one is say that your agency is negotiating with your top choice and those negotiations don't work out for whatever reason. If you release those records to say choice number two and choice number two found out they can charge, I don't know, $10,000 more. When you negotiate with choice number two, do you think they're going to keep the original bid or they're going to say, no, it's now $10,000 more? always $10,000 more. So that's why that is potentially closed until that bid is complete. So I told you there are over 50 discretionary closures all found in KSA 45 to 21. We didn't go over nearly all of them. There's no point in going over all of them. Um, certainly do feel free to take a look and see if there are any others that might apply to records you have. Um, the ones I talked about are the ones that we generally always talk about because they're the ones that are most present people. Um, so in addition to that, I mentioned this idea that you have something on a record, like a social security number, you still have to make the remainder of that record available to the public. So redaction, we used to love doing this with the good old Sharpie. Unfortunately, we now have computer programs that's not nearly as satisfying. So if a record contains material that is not subject to disclosure, you as a public agency have to separate or delete that material and then make the remainder of that record available to the public. You absolutely get a charge for your time, effort, and all the work that you do to do those redactions as part of the process. Anything you redact, I would definitely go back and cite to you why we're redacting as part of this record, whatever exception applies. So our website is ag.ks.gov. 
on our website, we have a number of resources available to the members of the public. You have a place where you can request training if you want. We also have a list, uh, quite a few resource documents that might be useful. We have our records policy. We have open government training slides. We have a book that we should actually print out. It's called The Citizen's Guide to Cora and Coma. Um, so if you have any patrons that are interested in it, they can now download it straight off of our website. I also have a copy of that Kansas administrative regulation that I mentioned. Um, heaven forbid, um, we have to go back under an emergency declaration, but I'm not making any statement about the world we live in. I wouldn't be shocked if we had to. Um, so that is also on this website. Also a place where people can file for <coughs> complaints with our office. Um, under the Open Meetings and the Open Records Act, our office has concurrent jurisdiction at the same level of jurisdiction as county and district attorneys to hear complaints about the Open Records or Open Meetings Act. You can fill out that form on our website if anybody wants to file a complaint. If you want to see how other government entities have, I want to say, aired in the past, we do have copies of enforcement actions on our website. So with that, here is my contact info. If anybody needs to get a hold of me for any reason, I said one of the reasons I work there is I am to help answer questions as best I can to keep people from being one of the people on our enforcement page. I will note this: to the best of my knowledge, anybody that I've ever talked to on the phone and has actually listened to me has never been subject to one of our enforcement actions. I have been cited in four enforcement letters, and in all four of those cases, they didn't listen to me. Um, so I had to get cited by name in the letter, and I don't like that that much. So does anybody have any questions about open records? Like I said, I know it's not the most exciting thing in the world, but it is something we all deal with about every day. It's all process, process and calendar. Okay. On that note. On security cameras, is there, I just want to clarify 100% whether you're still mm. you're accessible to only? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. When, when I say that you have discretionary ability to not provide it, it's exactly that. It doesn't mean you can't provide it. Let me give you an example. Just last week, I had somebody cross the street, down, just across the street to the library. Mm -hmm. um, our security camera happened to catch what was going on at their house. Sure. Rans over to the library demands a copy of the no. security camera. And of course our staff said, no, you'd have to get it from the police. Is that, is that- That's an um, appropriate answer. Is that appropriate? That's an appropriate answer. Because that's what we did. You certainly can provide them access to it. You don't have to. You don't have to. Well, and at the point we didn't know what really, who was doing what, right. you know, what was going down and he could have been using it to, you know, attack someone else on whatever happened. No, I understand completely. There's no requirement that you have to provide access to those. Okay. But frankly, if that person gets an attorney and they file a court act, there's potential that you would have to provide access to it at some point, but not under court. How long do you have to keep those records? If I give it over to the no. police, is, is my duty done? In that case, it's a police record, so the police will have it. Um, you maintain those records for however long you maintain them under whatever your retention requires you to do. Okay. Um, the great answer under the Open Records Act is I don't have that record anymore because I don't have to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love that your retention schedule. I'm sorry, we had those records until three months ago and they were all destroyed pursuant to X. Not because I don't want to give them a record, just I'm happy that I don't got to do the work, frankly. <laughs> well, I, was, I was told in, the, in my archival class that if you're going to keep records and videos and security cameras and all this kind of stuff, mm -hmm. that you better have a retention schedule and you better follow it. Otherwise somebody will sue you for not doing certain things because you don't get the record. We live in a very litigious world, so yes. Work, so um, I, do it, do it. I don't want us to have, I don't want my agency to have any records longer than we have to. And it's not because I don't want to provide people access to records. It's just, I want to know what we actually have. Right. I'm supposed to have a record for three years because we have a retention schedule so we keep it for three years. I don't want to find out I have it for 15 because I may not know to ask in the first place. So absolutely follow your retention is safer. Let me go back to what you were saying about security cameras. You have an incident and it's reported the police come in, you let them view this, mm -hmm. and then it's potentially used yep. in a court setting because it's still illegal. Mm -hmm. They have to go back to the subpoena to request it. I think it would be up to you to determine whether or not you want to cooperate with that law enforcement agency. I'll that. Because the one person who owned the place 
if we have the key came in requested it, we went ahead. But I told the police if you're going to be asking that, you're going to have to come and give us a reason. Right. Right. So nobody really has any extra special access to your records. Um, doesn't mean they won't come and claim they do. They're subject to the same laws as everybody else. But just because somebody, let's say someone comes in and has been using our, our computers for three hours and just say don't use it anyway, mm. and they want to use the security camera to find out what they've been on, um, and the FBI comes in and says, hey, I want this, you can say you'll have to get a subpoena for that because that person so, wasn't breaking the law. Once we know. start getting into these specific questions, we're going to ask for the FBI acceptance. I got to go back to company line. I want to say I need you to talk to your legal counsel. Who's going to have that to represent be, you when the FBI shows sure. after you? That would be so. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, that's, that's the sort of thing that we do. Oh, yeah. So, on that note, I want to thank everybody for the time. Awesome. I learned a lot. <laughs> now I need to correct some things. <laughs> I, I don't hear anything. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, guys. Hey, thank you. Have fun in little Jerusalem. Yeah, I've been to see it ever since it was allowed to be happy, so might as well. All right, good. <laughs> good.
Just the president, and the secretary. Uh, and just sit right here because you'll be by the microphone. Okay. Uh, okay. You don't want to be that close, do you? No, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> do we? Well, after you do the roll call, I mean, you don't have to stick around yeah, yeah. there. Oh, I could leave. Could I? Right. I have to stay after the roll call. Right. Well, I mean, I don't want to interrupt after that. <laughs> but you can be there just to be supportive, correct? That's right. Okay, I'll sit here. Okay. <laughs> Guys, the room is so big. I mean, we're just going to be. I wonder what we all look like when he was doing his second half. Oh, yeah. 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 And George, I noticed that Joanne's not on here, but she was approved at the county commissioner's meeting. Oh, okay, she was. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Good. So I didn't know if you needed that. I do need that but, um, from the newspaper. Is that I know? No, I don't need it like officially. I just need to know. Yeah. She yeah. She was approved okay, last Tuesday. So we need to hear from all counties. 
Um, I have not. Oh, yes, I did. No, I did. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. I think we only have that. So I, she, I know that she wasn't on the list, so I thought, oh, I didn't think I was supposed to call somebody. <laughs> I knew that they were just thrilled to know that we had a name. So uh, well, right. that's what I did too. I just went to the courthouse. <laughs> Is it okay if I give you a name? They were like, yes. I'm not sure that I know what I'm doing. After that little session, I'm not sure I've been doing anything. Yeah, I think we I would like to call uh, this meeting of the Northwest Kansas Library System full system board meeting to order. Uh, the first item of business today is a roll call. Okay, should I read the ones that are vacant? Okay. Um, Decade, Decatur, Julie, Julie Carter. Present on Zoom. Oh, Dave, is that still muted? Thank you. I'm here. I see her. She's there. Okay, I see. Um, Julie Carter. Present. She's got her. I see her, but. Present. Got her. I'm unmuted. There she is. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Julie, hang on just a minute. I yeah. think we're having some technical difficulties here real quick. Okay. Now have a try. Okay. You want to try now, Julie? Okay, here I am. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> hear you. <laughs> Woohoo! We were up there instead of here. Okay. Uh, Logan, Betty Hawker Smith. Uh, Sheridan, Bob Talbot. Uh, Thomas, Nancy Sadler. Trigo, Kathy Sherfick. Wallace, Lisa Walker. Almina City, Harold Rivera. I'm here. All right. <laughs> uh, USD 212 Northern Valley, John Vincent. Atwood Public, Grace Castens. Bird City, Diane Burns. US Oh, she has her hand up. Okay, I can't see that. Okay, I am. Right. Uh, USD one hundred three. Shylin, Melissa Dart. USD three fourteen. Brewster, Chris Hoyt. I'm here. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> NWKS Heritage Center. Oh, sorry, that's vacant. Pioneer Memorial, Melanie Wilkes. Yeah. HF Davis Memorial, CCC, Tara Schroeder. Here. Heartland Christian School, Rhonda Myers. NWKS Groundwater, Wynn Duffy. Yeah. Sacred Heart School, Amanda Juneman. USD 315 Colby, Sandy Wilkes. Here. Goodland Public, Karen Gellihan, here. USD 352 Goodland, Barb Bedore. NWKS Tech College, Brianna Henry. Here. 
Thank you. Gove City Feral Powers. Here. USD 292 Wheatland, Nicolette Cox. Here. Greenfield City, Bonnie Wood. Here. Moore Family, Melissa Meyer. Here. Thank you. USD 291 Grinnell, Patricia Ballman. Sheridan County, Kaylin Oak. Oh, miss, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. USD 412 Hoxie, Cindy Allmiller. I'm here Thanks. on Zoom. Jennings City, Joanne McKinney. McKenna. Lenora Public, Maxine Mai. Here. Uh, Norcater Public, Kathy Anthony. They heard me. I think that was Maxine. Maxine, we heard you. Yes, we heard you. Uh, Norton Correctional Facility, Brent Bogart. Norton Public, Patricia Hart. That's here. Thank you. US 211 Norton, Ashley Brooks. I am her alternate. Okay. Jane Burton. What is it? Jane Burton. Jane Burton. Thank you. Oakley Public, Steve Johnson. Here. USD 274 Oakley, Lana Steiner. St. Joe, uh, sorry, Oberlin City, Jody Scheich. Here. USD 294 Oberlin, Leah Gallantine. J. Johnson Public. Desiree Churchwell, USD 293, Quinter, Valerie Brown Cuchera, USD 316, Golden Plains, Judith Rogers, St. Francis Public, Nathan, uh, USD 297, St. Francis, Lisa Holsworth, Selden Public, Marsha Rogers. Here. Sharon Springs Public, Sharon Van Allen. I'm here as well as um, Lisa Walker for Wallace County. She's here. here Lisa, come here. <laughs> Hold on, we're a working library. Here. Okay, gotcha. Uh, USD 241 Wallace County, Joni Pierce. Here. Thank you. Wakini City, Mary Deaver. Here. USD 208 Wakini, Sonia Costner. USD 242 Weskin, Cindy Harold. Here. USD 275 Tri Plains, Jenna Gefeller. Here. 36 members. Right. We do have a quorum. We have 36 members. Um, I would like a motion for the approval of the minutes of the August 12th, 2020 meeting, which were in your packet. Is there, before there's a motion, is there any discussion or questions? If not, I would entertain a motion. Steve Johnson, Oakley, I move that we accept the minutes. Second. All right, go ahead. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of the August 12, 2020 meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. <laughs> Opposed? Okay. That was an aye, right? An aye, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is a financial report by George Seaman. Um, currently, we have spent 65.8% of our budget for the year. Uh, we're doing really well. Um, I don't know what else to say. 
Um, we are working on, uh, we received an ARPA grant and that will be for story walks. So that'll be a part of all this eventually. We're working on, or Mary submitted a SHARP grant through the um, Humanities Kansas. Um, and that is also money coming from the federal government. And we're also going to apply for another Humanities Kansas. So that will all be in our financial report as well eventually here. So financially, we're healthy. So. Very good. Maybe you should be a motion on that. All right, we will move on then to the executive committee report. And I guess I just want to make sure everybody can hear because um, I feel I feel like that um, this is our one time of the year that <clears throat> we can really let you know what's going on, what the executive committee um, hears about and what's approved and what the system is doing. Um, we meet on the second Wednesday of each month. Uh, we've met uh, with Zoom this year. Uh, we still haven't had a face-to-face -face meeting, but we're hoping for September and November if COVID will cooperate. Um, I've not enjoyed conducting meetings over Zoom, as any of you know who uh, have gotten to really gotten acquainted with Zoom. Uh, we get our business finished, but it's just so nice to see everybody's faces today. Uh, under the direction of George and the very innovative staff of Northwest Kansas Library System, the executive board has kept current on the work of the system. And I would just like to list some of the projects which involve the board and some which involve the staff. Um, <clears throat> of course, as we have in the past, we have approved uh, that the system will pay for all librarians' memberships and registration costs to KLA. Uh, in 2020, we chose Aubrey Kuhlman from Sharon Springs as our scholarship recipient, and then we will have another re recipient um, after our next meeting. Um, we did approve for some new shirts and jackets for the staff um, because we want to do what is, is good for our hardworking people. And then we also approved for some, some shirts for the students who participate in the William Allen White program. We provide grants to help pay the expenses for schools whose students do attend the William Allen White Awards celebration. This was um, by Zoom last year, but we still, I know that with the Weskin kids, we still had a great uh, celebration. Uh, the system did receive a Midwest Energy Grant for 3D printers, and these were received, I believe, by the <clears throat> system libraries uh, this spring who were interested. Uh, we did uh, approve that the new or that the rotation ban would uh, be decorated with some decals and it does look great. We always know when the van is present. Uh, it looks really good and Salina Blue did that work for us. Uh, we've been approached by Smoky Hills Television to provide sponsorship of children's programming. Um, we are still looking at options there, um, but we they would just need some financial support to keep those wonderful things going. Uh, George has been researching some options for dig digitizing historical documents, which are similar to Recollection Kansas, if you're uh, familiar with that. And we would like to find a program and financing that would allow us to help our, all of our libraries in the system that are interested in compiling local history and pictures. Uh, I think a grant is being written for that project. We've continued our agreement with Humanities Kansas for Talking Book Program and extended our membership with Friends of the Library for another year. Uh, we approved the hiring of Valerie as a tech assistant and we were hoping and are hoping and it sounds like that this position will alleviate some of the stress and strain for Dave. And we welcome you, Valerie. And also Aaron Davis was moved to become a full-time employee. Uh, the, our system employees uh, received an extra day off during December because it felt like it's really been a challenging year for everyone and the more that we can do for our employees, the better. Um, we also approved a one-time uh, economic impact, impact grant to our member libraries, and uh, which most, I think all of you received. The total amount of these grants were $22,275. Uh, 
We thank George for figuring out a way to help all of our member libraries that were impacted by COVID-19. We also awarded a grant of $3,000 to the HF Davis Library at Colby Community College because of the extra work that they do with OCLC and interlibrary loan. Um, we, we were still in progress. We have not given up on our bookmobile project. And also uh, George is still working on the quality assurance program for system services. So we, um, some of our projects just have not come uh, to fruition as quickly as we'd like, but we're still working on it. Um, and uh, George had mentioned story walks and, and um, we've been told that some of you are installing permanent story walks and, and I think that's really awesome that you want to do that. And it sounds like the money will be provided. Um, we've approved our 2021 budget plan and set a date for today for our system meeting. And we, we accepted a very positive audit report made by Brian Thompson of Mapes and Miller's accounting. So all of our actions affect either staff or member libraries in the Northwest Kansas library system. Our job as the executive committee is extremely easy due to a very capable staff. We appreciate each and every one who contributes to our library system. We are very blessed in Northwest Kansas to have so many services available, financial support through grants, technical support, and last but not least, labor. It would be interesting to know how many books have been moved through library reorganizations, books delivered through rotation program, hours spent on technology, installing, improving, and training. And we just want to say thank you to everyone. Now we will move on to George's report. All right. Are you supposed to sound like thunder? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so this year, um, some of you may know, I've tried to email it out and get it out there. Uh, we did uh, collaborate with the rest of the regional library systems and doing some, some uh, learning sessions this year. We brought in uh, Jamie LaRue and Pat Wagner, both national speakers. Um, we've had two sessions already. We've got a session coming up here in September on the 9th, and that will be Library Ethics with Pat Wagner. And then on December 9th, we will have an HR session with Jamie LaRue. So please register for those sessions and attend. They're really good. The first two were excellent. I went away with a couple pages of notes from both of them. So um, please take advantage of that opportunity. We are also continuing uh, our collaboration with the other regionals for Apple, which is the Applied uh, public library education program for new uh, library directors, and it's been a very successful program. Um, we continue to look for new ways to innovate, and one way that we're talking right now amongst the other regionals in the state library is doing something trustee training-wise. Um, unfortunately, all of us do trustee training in, in the regions, and we all recreate the wheel. So there's seven wheels, and we're like, why don't we just figure out a way that we can share this? Uh, the state library has mentioned that they'd like to be a part of this as well and we've actually opened up talks with wyoming um, what is it the wyoming library association i think to see if there's something we can all do together to mitigate us continuing to repeat and repeat the, the wheel over and over and over again um as i said earlier we applied for uh, the arpa grant i shouldn't say we mary did she did a great job with that um, and we, we received the funds and we have begun purchasing all the materials for the story walks. So we're excited for that. Um, and I also mentioned the, the uh, SHARP grant and um, we will be applying for that digitization grant soon as well. Um, we are working on um, the, a proposal as, as Cindy said earlier for our bookmobile. Um, it's become apparent that getting a bookmobile is going to be way more than and cost than we had anticipated. Um, and so one day I was perusing one of the uh, library journals and lo and behold, there's a library in I think it was North Carolina that they have a trailer that they pull around and that is their mobile library or their traveling library. So that got me to thinking of course and we've started doing research on that end. And so it might not be a bookmobile where you get on board and you know, but it, might be a, an alternate that an alternative uh, means that we can uh, actually achieve. And so we're really excited about the possibilities there too. 
Um, yes, the decals, great. We finally worked out our kinks too with the uh, newsletter. So that should be coming out more regularly. Um, recently, we helped Sheridan County Library move their stacks for new flooring. How's the, how's the remodel looking? The, Thumbs up. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, good news. Go City Library is going to be automating. And so we will be assisting in that process now, too. And so I think we will only have one other library that this needs to automate, public library. Um, we also helped Goodland with furniture. Yes. A big furniture order and delivery and setup. Oh, and my goodness. Yes. That was, that was quite a project. I big project. Um, and of course, we continue to work with KLA. Um, we're doing planning for a conference this year, which will be in person as we're still planning. There will be a hybrid component, so there will be online as well. Um, so if you aren't interested in traveling or for any reason whatsoever, there is that possibility. And Dave continues to work with the Sunflower e Library and he does amazing things. Um, holds ratio for, the, for Sunflower e Library at their lowest they've ever been. Um, and Dave continues to get money in from other libraries across the state to put towards purchasing new materials and on, on there. So um, it's, it's, it's been great. Um, last thing is, is uh, I, I was asked to apply for a position on the state library board. So I did all that. Um, I'm not sure I haven't gotten the appointment from the governor yet, but we'll see what happens there. So. We'll actually have a voice that will be strong from Western Kansas now. Mm -hmm. And that is all that I have. And I might add, uh, Alice and George did say <clears throat> at our last meeting how KLA, the work of KLA is kind of smoothed out and they feel like that with their staff, they're able to, to handle that. So I was really glad to hear that. So I think it started out as a pretty big laborious project. <laughs> Oh, I forgot to introduce staff. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. There's my staff. I lined up. Alice Evans, bookkeeper, Heather Fru in her library loan and talk books. Leah Marie, our come and go person. <laughs> what, what, you, you, our gypsy? Would that be it? No, <laughs> that probably wouldn't work. Huh? Mary Bowler, consultant. And then, of course, Valerie. Everybody's heard about her. And Dave. Uh, today, we, we are missing Erin. She was unable to attend today as well as Brianna's in school now, and she helps Dave with technology. And then uh, Crystal Anderson is in here and she is part-time helping Mary with children's services. I didn't miss anybody, right? <laughs> I'd be bad if I did. Very good. All right, um, moving on to old business. Is there any old business? If not, we'll move on to new business with the presentation of the 2022 plan of service and approval. Are there any comments or questions about the plan of service, which was also in your packet? If not, I need a motion for approval. Uh, second. second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the 2022 Northwest Kansas Library System Plan of Service. All in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, the revenue neutral rate hearing is now open. The presentation of Northwest Kansas Library System exceeding the revenue neutral rate. Uh, the resolution also was in your packet. So this is a new component. So we're not quite sure how we're gonna do this. We're working through this together. Any public comment on that? Mm -hmm. 
Any board member comment to that? If not, I would need a uh, motion for resolution number three to exceed the revenue neutral rate. Second. I second it, Desiree. It's been moved and seconded to approve the resolution number three to exceed the re revenue neutral rate. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The revenue neutral rate hearing is closed. Now the budget hearing is opened. The presentation of the 2020 Northwest Kansas Library System budget. This is also in the packet. And one of the uh quick and easy ways of seeing what's going on with this is the, the 2022 budget commentary. And I really appreciate it. You betcha. That yeah. were made it. I asked Alice on the phone the other day why you, how you got, you know, reduced your insurance by $10,000. And, um, and she just said because of staffing. And so that was a big one. I wanted to see what kind of insights you guys had gotten. Well, and, and because we're on the, um, the non state state plan. Right. Um, those numbers tend to fluctuate because if they get a build up of funds, then they push that savings then back to the employers and employees. So. Okay, any public comment on the, bu the budget? Is there any board comment on the budget? <clears throat> So I, sorry, this is kind of out of place, I think, but I, I just wanted to share with you, um, I've been doing this now, what, how long have I been doing this? 10 years? No, 11. We were just talking Budgets about that. And, stuff. and I'll tell you, this is one of the worst parts of my job, I think, is working with the board to come up with a budget because every year I am caught in this dilemma of, um, trying to continue to progress the system forward, trying to provide a living wage for my employees, trying to do everything that I can responsibly and yet not put that burden on those few people in the counties that have to pay that tax. It hurts me to think that the tax that we put on some of the farmers in those counties might mean the difference with them, between them buying a new implement that they might need or to fix an implement they might need or to buy shoes for their kid or something. And so I have to tell you, just from my heart, that this is always a challenge. And so I appreciate it. And I know the board does too, your support when we do these decisions and make these choices. I appreciate that because I love it when I hear the vote, whether it's yay, nay, whatever, because that means I must be moving in a positive direction or helping move us in a positive direction. So thank you um, for being here, for being attentive to all these crazy documents that we send you <laughs> that I know are hard to understand. And thank you for being a part of this process. And I think uh, George does the, does the work and, and the board um, tries to help, but uh, with George's understanding, this, this is how we come up with a, a good budget every year. With that, um, I need an approval for the 2020 Northwest Kansas Library System budget. This is Diane. I approve the 2020 budget. Diane. Diane. I'm on Zoom. Burns. Oh, sorry. Diane on Zoom. Diane on Zoom. Motion to accept the budget. Need a second? You have a second somewhere. Oh, I second that. Jody. Okay. Jody has seconded. All in favor of the approval of the 2022 Northwest Kansas Library System budget, please say aye. 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 
Opposed? Thank you. The budget hearing is closed. Uh, bylaw changes are up next, which we need to approve. Yes, and there was just the one small change in the wording. Just one change of wording. It was just a, a little change that we had to make because of uh, Senate Bill 13. I'm going to get it right now. I apologize. And I think it's in red. There we go. George, are you looking for the change you made? Yeah, I am. It's regarding uh, what the annual meeting will be. Yeah, okay. Two. two. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> There you go. Yes. So um, because of the fluctuation, it used to be under the old budget law that we had to have it the first two weeks of August. Now with Senate Bill 13, it can be farther down on the calendar, even into September. And so um, I wanted to change that so it wasn't so specific and say just in the month of August. That's why we did it. Okay. Thank uh, you. So I need a motion to approve the uh, change in the bylaws. To approve the bylaw changes, Sarah. Second. Jane, Jane Burton, second. Jane Burton seconds that. All in favor of the bylaw change, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Thank you. Um, Next, uh, we need to present the uh, new officers uh, of the um, executive board. I don't have my exact paper, but next one. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. So um, we was decided at our last executive board meeting that these um, members would serve as officers. Uh, our new chair is Cindy Amiller from Hoxie. First vice chair is Desiree Churchwell of Quinter. Second vice chair is Karen Gillahan, Goodland. Secretary, Patricia Hart, Norton. And treasurer, Tara Schroer of Colby. I need a motion to accept the new officers as presented. I need a second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the 2022 executive board officers. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So Thank you. Didn't Cindy Amiller, hmm? yes. <laughs> Cindy are you cool? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I had a wait, what moment? <laughs> <laughs> is this, board my has, <laughs> this board has a uh, habit of surprising people with the uh, presidency. <laughs> <laughs> so it was Cindy's turn this year. Uh, are there any announcements? Everyone stays and eat even if you didn't sign up, staying with your friends. Or take some with you. <laughs> so I have a question, George. How yes. would, can you just explain? I know we haven't done KLA sign up for a while. Would you kind of outline for us how you want that done? Okay, sure. Um, so I, I was waiting till after this meeting, honestly, because this is okay. this takes up a lot of time. <laughs> but thank you. Um, what we're going to do is just like in previous years, we're going to put a form up on our webpage 
um, and have you then go ahead and say, hey, I'm interested in going to KLA. I'd like a room. I'd like to ride with you guys, or I'm gonna take drive myself, just so that we know financially where we're gonna be looking to, because we'll pay for mileage. Um, we're gonna take care of the hotel rooms. If you go eat with us, we'll pay for your meals. Um, and you can even ride down with us if you want to. So we'll make all of that available and have you sign up online so we know who's interested in going. So, good question and thank you. Digital Zoom option. Mm -hmm. Do you still have how much is that? Is that the same? Yeah. And we'll cover the cost of that too. And George mentioning how much work it is getting ready for this meeting. I also want to comment on the strategic plan. I think there's a lot of really good details in there and a really good example of how maybe your own library could could come up with a good plan. So I I appreciate that too. We didn't go over the annual report, but it was really good. Yeah, yeah it, was. it was. Thank you. Yeah. And we actually changed it, or I changed it a little bit too. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And it also is going to give me great opportunity to use in my annual report so that I can get some closure. Excellent. Good. Anything else? All right, then I will entertain a motion for adjournment. <laughs> yep, Nicolette. And a second, please. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn the 2021 full system board meeting. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Really good turn on things in the list. We're really a good turn on. Very good. Mm -hmm. That was crazy. Yeah. 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 Um, that was really good. We had to, um, those that registered first, the first 20 people are going to be able to be the same. Whichever one of these lovely bags, they're going around. Oh, man. I can't remember when I registered. I couldn't even remember registering. So, I was. So, Matthew, I of Lenora. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You want you want to come up here, Mary? Hey, Mary. You want to come up here so you're closer to the speaker, so Maxine mine knows that she won a prize. You can go look around. Yeah, go look around. Okay. Um, all right. So number one was Maxine Mai. So she gets to pick. Well, well, we'll pick for her. Sorry, Maxine. <laughs> Mary's picking hers now. Melanie Wilkes. <laughs> we have Nathan. Me. <laughs> and we have Bonnie Wood. Um, Grace Caskins will get one. Karen Gillahan. Oh, yay. Yay. Hey, look at you. Go pick your basket. Pat <laughs> Ballman is not oh, here, but we'll get good. one for her. Julie Carter. Steve Johnson. Ooh. Nicolette Cox. We have Joan McKenna. Judy Rogers. Marsha Rogers. Kayleen, oh, is it Olke? Is that how I say that? Is it Kayleen? Okay, my answer. Answer. <laughs> Jody, Shiky, yeah, that's you. Nancy Sadler, John Vincent, Chris Hoyt, and Tina Sager. Those are our 20 winners, so congratulations. <laughs> Oh, the top selling cases are for the ones you like today. Oh, yeah. I just I just I just I just I just I just I
I'm glad I have that in there. Okay. Yeah. I don't get much feedback. No, and I should. Comment on some other things. Oh yeah. You didn't have. I was. I was. Every time you get a feedback, she puts it into that sheet. send you your prize. Oh, she just left. <laughs> Thank you everybody for being here. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. Yes. Definitely so uh Diane, that's awesome. Thank you everybody. Appreciate your time and Supporting the system. See you, Harold. <laughs> Bye, Elizabeth. 